to all of you sirs and madam for being here with us and uh, we hope that you had a, a real nice time so yeah we can see the smile on your uh, faces and uh, so we also would like to extend once again a heartfelt gratitude to the university to the founders to all those great men who have uh, laid the foundation stones for this university to come up to this uh, extent so thank you all sirs and abs absentia for all the support the encouragement the cooperation that uh, you have been extending to the department of english uh, in particular so this morning we have uh, the much awaited uh, plenary speech of uh, professor prantik banerji he is a professor hislop college nagpur and more than being an academician and a professor he is a great romantic of language and literature sir i do compliment supplement agree with you and uh, because uh, i am a very passionate lover of literature so uh, that's how i i am really falling i have fallen for you and i also wish yeah and i also take this opportunity to request all the scholars not to lose affinities or that roots with literature because without literature there is no language everyone can take it from me without literature there is no language absolutely but people are deviating digressing so uh, let's come back to the roots because uh, as madam also has said in uh, her diaspora speech the roots are very important and uh, getting uh, back to the roots again and again though we you know deviate or uh, uh, go back uh, have the adopted culture but still we cling on to the roots that is very important so with these few words before i call upon the guests i would uh, I'd like to invite dr ray ramadevi assistant professor department of english to do the profile reading of our dear sir thank you ma'am uh, good morning distinguished guests delegates participants and my dear colleagues it's my privilege to introduce prantik banerji dr prantik banerji is professor of english hislop college nagpur He tries to make his students romance with language and literature. He encourages young minds to break rules in his classes. For he believes that you can't be creative until and unless you are a habitual rule breaker. He has written insightful essays on viruses, Google babies, comics, cyborgs, chiclet, films, AI and techno romance and other things that we all call pop tech culture. His books on culture, politics, history and literature despite the new virus of cancel culture and prescribed as textbooks and reference material. His publications include 9 books, 12 chapters and 46 research papers in peer reviewed journals. His recent books are A Handbook of Research in English Studies, Teaching of Culture and Cultural Teaching, Cultural Studies Text and Context. theory in praxis discourse in literature and culture cultural studies text and context theory in praxis and teaching of culture are now listed as reference books in the universities of columbia princeton michigan and pennsylvania his writings are prescribed as textbooks and reference books in mumbai university don bosco university kerala university north gujarat university christ university and nagpur university He has been a member of the syllabus design for several universities. He has designed the syllabus of cultural studies, trauma studies, disability theory, medical humanities, energy humanities, post-colonial literatures, Shakespeare for the 21st century and research methodology. His writings have been published in several anthologies including Globalization, Reader and then Asian Literature in English. films and literature conflict studies and race caste and gender he is on the editorial board of several international and national journals on higher education as well as english studies he is also a poet and short story writer his books of short stories the keeper of the dead won the clr international award for the best experimental fiction in 2021 his writings have been published in sahitya academies indian literature little magazine pen international 
journal of indian poetry fest etc he is former me board member of uh, board of studies rtm nagpur university he is an external expert on the board of studies of homi baba U state university subject expert for vg ways autonomous college mumbai and christ university bangalore he is a phd supervisor for rtmnu and an examiner for several universities he is an academic counselor for the creative writing course of igno he was invited as an expert on the drafting committee of ncci national higher education policy he edited the kakodkar committee report of national institute of technology nits he prepared and presented triennial conference statement of aiache at christ university bangalore he has served as subject expert on the selection committees for appointment of lecturers by saint stephen's college new delhi xavier's college mumbai and many other colleges he is a certified hrd trainer from tcs bangalore and has conducted several teacher and corporate training programs he has been a keynote speaker and resource person at several international and national conferences he has delivered endowment lectures in university of rochester usa lyla college chennai jyoti nivas college bengaluru and the royal bhutan university he is a nac expert and rusa trainer and has conducted many training programs for colleges and universities in india he is an external advisor to iqac of reputed colleges and universities and empaneled as national faculty trainer for aiche new delhi his passion is teaching and researching he also loves to teach creative writing to youngsters and conduct workshops on research writing and methodology he is a curious traveler and loves to be footloose and fancy free he loves to travel to places where he can find buried stories and forgotten histories he has recently learned to update the world about his status on whatsapp with this we welcome you sir thank you ma'am thank you sir for i think this uh, profile should be an inspiration for all of us here and the sir is coming up with a very novel topic so keep watching and listening my dear uh, friends No, this is overwhelming. I mean, looking at the chairs at the back. <laughs> A very good morning to all of you. Profiles are supposed to be profiles. Thanks for the rather exhaustive and exhausting introduction. Uh, when Sunalini ma'am asked me to send the bio, uh, I said brief and uh, feel free to do an Ezra palm. Uh, Uh, but I guess uh, they have been the generous and polite and very courteous hosts that they have been. Uh, not a single thing has been omitted. Friends, um, I like that phrase. You know, the minute I saw the uh, brochure of the conference, I like that phrase uh, in the conference title: "Transformations and Transitions." And I think uh, what I Uh, I've been mulling over this phrase transitions and transformations, and I'm going to pitch my talk uh, on a note of on a note of provocation. To you. I'm going to pitch my talk around this phrase transformation and transitions, because I believe this international co conference organized by Kale University uh, should and can and should make us mm, aware. or let me put it in this way in eliot's words it should make us um, hear the key turn in the lock and by that of course i don't mean one key i mean several keys that unlock several doors doors to what doors to what the subtitle of your conference is emerging trends in english studies so um, yesterday session has already you know uh, introduced us to new areas especially in the field of interdisciplinary english studies um ganesh nayar sir my good friend and also a one time phd my phd examiner uh, 
I think made us both surf the waves as well as deep dive deep into uh, not the shallows but the depths, full fathoms five, as he said, uh, into the area of very very fascinating area of blue blue humanities. But what I wish to start today uh, as a kind of um, opening remarks. Uh, is something that you and I, as English teachers, English researchers, broadly, generally the English fraternity, I believe sh we shy away from meeting something head on. So what's the elephant in the room? There is an elephant in the room, and I'm not talking about the grid failure, nor am I talking about this uh, piece of technology that you see in front. Uh, the elephant in the room is, friends, all about our very survival. What do I mean by survival? I don't want you to jump out of your seats and scare you. What do I mean by uh, your very, our very survival? Uh, I think there is a problem of precarity, especially in the humanities. I think that uh, English studies as a discipline, uh, you know, is more and more losing out to the market economy. And we, its practitioners, you and I, and future, our own students in the classrooms, are becoming increasingly irrelevant and obsolete in, let us say, a techno-driven digital age. So, uh, will today's English departments, the fact that we are holding a conference under the aegis of the English Department of Care University and many other universities, uh, should will English departments uh, close tomorrow? I mean, I, this is not a Cassandra prophecy, and I'm not going, doing a soothsayer's Ides of March doomsday prophecy either. But I believe that this is a serious problem, and whatever we do, especially in the many, many conferences that happen every year, I think um, somehow or the other, uh, it's very important to connect our thoughts, our deliberations, the proceedings of every conference to the very... Um, to the acknowledgement, not just the acknowledgement, uh, to the sort of invisibility, to make visible the invisibility of English studies in India, and not just in India. By the way, English departments and English study centers are, are closing down in the West as well. So I think it's important that, you know, when we talk about our survival, yours and mine, uh, a lot of... Uh, state planning policies, institutional practices are in some way unwittingly collaborating in order to pull the curtains down on English studies and English departments. Uh, and I feel very strongly about it, very strongly. In fact, many of the times the adda over chai, chai pe chacha that we do, especially with my friend Dinesh sir, we often talk about uh, you know, that English studies are getting short-changed. More and more, they're getting short, short-changed. I mean, on what count, you, all, you and I know it. Less funding, resource crunch, uh, faculty shortage. And uh, typically, a research, research that is becoming unproductive in terms of its market value, in terms of its util, so-called uh, utilitarian purpose. So with, which, with each passing year, at least in my state and in my university, few student, fewer students are enrolling for the MA program or for that matter, the literature program in PA and fewer teachers want to teach. And only the few brave hearts, and I believe those brave hearts are there at the back, especially the young, the millennials are there. Only those brave hearts who venture forth to make teaching of English a career not just a vocation, but an avocation. I mean, you know, what are we offering them? We who are senior teachers, we who are policy makers, and sometimes in board of studies, what are we offering them? In fact, what we are not offering them is perhaps even a secure job or even a career prospect or a secure fellowship, which seems more like a nightmare or more like a mirage. Hand wringing and chest beating is not what is I'm here for. I'm here for to address something that is very topical. I thought I'll begin uh, with a note of provocation, as I said, spinning around transformation and transition. So what are we offering? What are we transforming here? What are, what are we moving from stage A to stage B? What are we taking our students forward, future research scholars forward? 
Hale University, what we have seen yesterday, I believe this conference is providing us with some lungfuls of oxygen. Not just the green campus outside, of course it does, right? But I think uh, what both in our both in those wonderful talks of our resource persons, uh, a keynote address, as well as uh, the plenary sessions here, uh, it's already providing us with some hope. Hope, and that word "emerging trends," I believe, is no longer. At least right now, I feel that it's no longer a hackneyed phrase, which is used in any number of conferences. I believe there is something new in the air. <laughs> and I believe that uh, what we are doing today, maybe on a very micro scale, micro scale, our narratives are going to be micro narratives. I love histories, as was told, but history is not mainstream histories, histories from the underground, histories that are subterranean. And I'm going to touch on a topic which is subterranean, by the way. So I believe that there is something new in the English, uh, happening already in the English air. And, um, you know, what we call, uh, what uh, I believe is going to become the future direction of new of humanities, humanity studies in general and English studies in particular what I would like to call, for want of a better word, new humanities. I call this new humanities because what we said, what uh, what we heard yesterday about ocean humanities or blue humanities is precisely the directions, the many one of the many directions in which we can chart the course, the trajectory of English studies, and and rescue who, rescue us, salvage our own situations, which I said. Uh, the key word to describe is precarity. So, uh, like Frost, I would like to say something there is that doesn't like a wall. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so my my talk today, friends, is going to be a boundary breaker. It's going to be a wall breaker. I've already been introduced rather, uh, uh, or rather it was my choice of words, actually, no fault of the introducer. I am a rule breaker. So, um, Something that I thought would uh, I would introduce to you as also one of the terrains, with, one of the things that is changing the very terrain, the very landscape of uh, English studies. This is something that is highly, um, in Sunali Nisman's words, highly inflammable. Yesterday she said, my topic seems to be very inflammable. I'll add a little more word, another word to it. It's not just inflammable, it's very incendiary. Uh, because it can ignite strong passions, it can it can actually fuel um, extreme reactions to extreme reactions. What is the thing? The thing is oil. Of course, yeah, the thing is oil, and the subject of my discourse is literature, not just in the time of oil, but literature on, off, and about oil. Before that. Uh, so can you please move to the next slide? Yeah. Friends, to think about oil is not just to think about automobiles, derricks. It's not to think about spectacular spills, or for that matter, the, the barrel prices. I mean, every time there is a price hike, petrol hike, you and I, what do we do? We rush to the petrol pump in order to fill our tanks to make sure that we beat the government's price hike by at least a few, you know, few rupees. Yeah. My wife does something clever. She rushes and then she takes, uh, you know, jerry can cans. No, I was just kidding. <laughs> okay. But the point really is that uh, we are here today because of oil. You and I have gathered here because of oil. Oil in various forms, of course, in various shapes, and therefore the fluidity, the fluidity of our discussion and deliberation today in my talk is essentially fuel ridden, fuel driven. And the reason is very simple. Our living realities are soaked, steeped, and saturated by oil. Oil determines how we live, how we move, what we wear, even this piece of uh, techno gadget that you see is a hydrocarbon product made out of what? Made out of petroleum. Right. Um, 
this particular documentary it's been a much much talked about documentary some of you may have already seen it it's actually a documentary made on the 2006 oil peak crash there was a crisis in 2006 and uh, this is a film about peak oil about the crisis in the production and the consumption of oil and what uh, what this documentary shows it gives us a kind of a alarming an alarming uh, 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 account of it traces both the historical events the long history of oil its materiality its geopolitics as well as its impact on everyday lives including our social and cultural formations it also makes predictions about glob- global the global consumption of peak oil and um, I don't know you know world energy council report I was reading the world energy council report as a preparation for my talk and uh, the latest one the one in 2023 it kind of predicts that by 2050 2050 as planetarians right as earthlings we are going to be uh, we are likely to use 60% more energy than today and which also means that there is going to be an exponential increase in the depletion of what we call fossil fuels that includes oil of course and also gas coal for that matter so uh next slide the question to ask is are we living in a culture what we call culture we talk about post colonial cultures we call about green cultures you know we talk about digital cultures is it possible to call our postmodern postmodern cultures as hydrocarbon cultures i would say yes yes this is something that probably slips out of our social imaginary even in our academic forum for the simple reason that oil has this peculiar habit when it runs the world around it's invisible oil is everywhere oil is ubiquitous and uh, one of the first uh, critical works that i read as an introduction some you know a good 7 or 8 years back uh, was stephanie lee manica uh, she was uh, she wrote a book called petro cultures in fact the title of the book is not there on the slide it's called living oil living oil petro culture in the american century and basically it's a first book length study of uh, the imbrication the many ways in which oil and hydrocarbon is imbricated with our political economies as well as our social economies and uh, you know the book the book is a very very interesting book uh, why because in you know she engages with a wide spectrum of cultural forms uh, including museum exhibits uh the oil industry of course and then still photography films fiction etc etc to show once again to demonstrate the to exhibit the ev- what she calls the everywhereness of oil the everywhereness of oil and i think her book again is a kind of a uh, you know it shows the way forward that if if humanity today is at a critical juncture then the precarity the precarity of humanities the precariousness of humanities can be rescued especially by our critical engagements with a book like stephanie lemenegas the living oil she shows how academic writing academic writing and interdisciplinary writing on culture on the intersections between culture literature and petrocarbon economies is something that our future scholars or for that matter our academy itself should implement should introduce immediately not wait for something as future studies not at all uh the the common thread that is going to that you oh, know around which i'm going to weave my talk is basically point out that whatever we are talking here is not hot air we are talking in relation to what you and i do or should be doing in our classrooms and in research centers so it's really no exaggeration to say that uh, modern culture is a petro culture 
At the same time, what Stephanie, there's a nice little word, a oh, word that she coins called petrosphere. It's not atmosphere. We no longer can talk about living in a world where, uh, you know, thanks to climate change and global warming, it's no longer possible to be talking about our atmosphere as a neutral, value-free word. It's a loaded word, friends. And it is loaded essentially because what she calls petrosphere. Petrosphere, I mean, even the particles, you and I, I mean, uh, the way, the amount of carbon emissions that we emit and we inhale, we exhale and inhale, is what makes us go to the ICUs, by the way. Partly, one of the reasons, right. So, um, in another interesting book, uh, which many of you would have read in environmental studies or green studies, uh, I'm talking about Frederick Buell. Frederick Buell has written another, a seminal book, a seminal book called uh, A Short History of Oil Cultures. And where he makes us aware that right from the beginning of the 19th century, well, not beginning, in the mid-19th century, what we talk about the period between what we call the Great Acceleration, the epoch of great acceleration, where first coal and then diesel and then oil and then gas, all of it turbo jetted or hot wheeled the whole of American fiction, for instance. Right. So, what uh, Frederick Buell says is that energy history is intricately, intrinsically entwined with cultural history. And so, um, you know, this is a kind of a singular paradox of our living reality that while, uh, you know, oil has saturated, as I said, every aspect of our life, uh, it still is kind of, in a Derridian sense, you could say, it is absent present. And it's very interesting uh, that Derrida should be talking about slippages because oil is slick, oil is slippery but oil also sticks in a bad way, I'm saying. So, uh, this aporia of oil in our cultural discourses, in our narratives on emerging trends, yeah, is somehow missing, all right? Its reasons and repercussions are something that I would like to dwell on at length. Next slide, please. So what connection does literature or literature reading has to do with oil? Next one. Next slide. If I said that literature, right from, you know, right from 18th and 19th century onwards, that literature has shifted or rather there has been an oil turn or let me say, put it in this way, there has been an energy turn to the way writers have written and the way uh, it has been received right from the beginning of the 19th century, well, I would be actually stating the obvious truth. An obvious truth because it is an obvious truth and a given fact, therefore it escapes us. It escapes our attention. Um, you and I teach English literature. Most of it is British literature, American literature, but even if you focus on English literature, what if I said uh, with uh, on the lines of uh, another very important energy critic named Patricia Yeager in a book called The Aesthetics of Petroleum. Friends, imagine a title such as this, The Aesthetics of Petroleum, right? Uh, she raises a very, very pertinent question and a very provoking question. She says, how does one use energy as the lens through which to view culture? How does one use energy as the lens to view culture, all right? Let's put it in a more specific way as uh, English teachers. How do we look at British literature? So traditionally, how do we teach British literature in our classrooms? Well, there are two common ways. One is, I'm talking about the timelines. We break it into timelines, into a chronology. So 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. Uh, the other way is to, um, is to introduce to our students on, uh, not just in terms of chronology, but in terms of movements, trends. So we talk about classicism, neoclassicism, romanticism, modernism, postmodernism, etc., etc. But let's pause for a minute. Well, not an exact minute. One second. Yeah. Can we uh, can we think of Dickens? 
uh, or 19th century literature uh, without suit and tallow. You know that line, uh, that slide, that image there in the center is a line from Hard Times, Dickens' Hard Times. And if you pay attention to that, well, it's not an exceptional paragraph. It's not an exceptional line, you know, that very often in critical theory, theory studies, what we do is we read a text or rather uh, like an archaeologist, we dive deep into the text in order to ferret out only those lines which suit the critical framework. No. My point really is that if you go back to hard times and you do an energy reading of it, don't be surprised. Uh, well, not oil, but don't be surprised if tar, candles, tallow, all of them pop up. You think about a poem like Chimney Sweepers, for instance, what is it all about? Well, we can do an oil reading of it, right? So, um, or think about Lawrence, dear Lawrence. How can we even read or enter into Lawrence's fiction without talking about coal and collieries? How can we um, uh, think of Eliot or Philip Larkin? Or without thinking about steam and coal? How can we think about uh, uh, Arthur Miller or uh, Cormac McCarthy without the road play, Death of a Salesman as a road play? I would do a reading of the, in the class, I did a reading of, in my MA's, uh, MA English class of Death of, Death of a Salesman as a, not, as a road rage play. Well, not in terms of how many people did he run over, did uh, Loman, uh, Willie Loman run over, but I'm saying how, did, how was he run over by the pressures of an American dream fueled by what? Oil. So, uh, can we think of, uh, can we therefore, what energy humanities does and oil politics does is to completely reinvent, open our eyes into different readings, in a different alternative reading of texts which are embedded, which are embedded in the politics of oil, which are embedded in the cultural specificities of oil. So, next slide. These are some of the questions that I probably would leave you with. No, I'm not exiting, but I'm saying leave you with as something to mull over, something to actually bring into your own interventions of literature, your own, shall I put it in this way, re-readings of literature. I can't see. Okay. So it's like, uh, friends, oil, the thrust of the initial point that I was trying to make is that oil certainly is not just a material resource. It has a cultural value. It has a social impetus. It changes the very geopolitics of the world over. I mean, think about every time uh, oil oil production goes down or the price of oil barrels go up. Think about how quickly, how quickly the next day you and I and everybody else in this petrosphere is impacted by oil. So, um, it wouldn't be wrong for me to say that oil and with many other energy critics to suggest that oil has shaped our modernity, what we call post-industrial, post-modern realities. But then, the minute we say we fast forward to the 21st century and we are talking about a post-industrial, post-modern modernity, well, uh, let us not forget also that oil has a long history. Energy carbon, uh, the use of uh, fossil fuels has a long history, a history which we can tie up. It goes all the way to 15th and 16th century spice trade. What used to be the spice routes is now taken over by the oil routes. Yesterday, Dinesha talked about... Uh, Amitav Ghosh's The Nutmeg's Curse, right? Well, he talked about, he does talk about spice. He talks about opium roots and spice roots. But then uh, he also mentions in brief about petroleum roots, oil roots. And this is something, again, that doesn't come into our mainstream discussions. And if it does, it's mostly limited, restricted to the global north, to the academy and the local. Uh, notice that all the eminent critics that I've talked about are all from the West. And isn't it surprising that in a coal-rich country like ours, not oil-rich, but a coal-rich country like ours, where the, one of the most familiar sites, if you've been traveling by train or been at the railway station, is what? Goods train laden with coal. But it's not just goods train laden with coal. Goods train laden with coal with a pilfered on the way. 
in shanties by people who survive, whose two meals, meals a day are cooked on coal that is pilfered and stolen. And this is a reality right by our railway lines. So anyway, so, um, you know, to think about Charles Dickens, to think about the writings of Charles Dickens, to think about the entire literature. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, now it's better. So to think about the entire history of what we call English literature. Why English literature? Well, I'll come to that American. Why not American literature? But in a short while. You know, the writing, right from Charles Dickens, Joseph Conrad, John Steinbeck, Arthur Miller, Amitav, or, uh, yeah, even, even Amitav Ghosh, I mean, is to think about oil, is to think about petrol economies. Um, all right. Next slide, please. Hmm. Our interpretation, uh, yesterday, I mentioned Peter Barron. Well, it's a big Right. But then um, our whole concept of text has changed, isn't it? We are talking about textuality in everything. Textuality in not just the literary text, the textuality of films, the textuality of memes, the, te the textuality of what, of even uh, Insta, or the textuality of this piece. Right. So when you talk about that, um, in at least in the last 10 or 15 years, Oil has gained considerable traction, cultural traction, and has manifested itself in cultural expressions. And I, when I say cultural expressions, in several forms, in several diverse forms, not just literature, which I'm going to give a few specific examples. My talk again, the examples are all foregrounded on literature itself. But, but, these are, what you see on the slide, are once again, uh, give us uh, the heteroglossia ways, the polyphonic ways in which oil finds expressions, manifestations in different ways. What you see is an oil installation, by the way, and air and uh, what is called a carbon installation. Those nice looking pink or purple are actually oil drops. Painted and installed where? On a lake by the, by the Hyde Park in London. It's called, uh, just a sec. What is it? Ah, it's called a masaba. Not surprising. Okay. Um, in the whole of world literature, in the whole of world literature is embedded in, uh, like I've been saying, in an energy-driven tropes. In energy-driven tropes. And when I talk about world literature, we are talking about, you, you can consider any form, any type, any genre of world literature. We are not, I'm not talking about the topo, the, the geographical locations of world literature. I'm talking in terms of, let's say, experimental fiction, science fiction, magic realism, you name it. Uh, young research scholars, you only have to Google now oil fiction and what you will have is an astonishing variety of the narratives that unfold before you in the many ways in which we have learned to classify literature and read them as, you know, whether we are calling it magic realism or whether we are call calling it uh, uh, experimental fiction. Um, interestingly, uh, yesterday we talked about Rhyme of the Ancient Marie. And I saw in the technical session somebody presented a paper uh, it's called the rhyme of the modern Verina. Yeah, uh, the rhyme of the. You know what? What is it about? It's about oil anxiety. It's about an existential crisis. A man, we know the story is a take is a is a kind of a takeoff from the sailor and his albatross. But here is a man sitting uh, in a park. Right, he's uh, he's having a burger or something uh, wrapped up in what plastic. Right. And somebody comes by, strolls past him, and he throws that plastic, which get, which makes that moment for him not in a joyous and epiphanic moment, but that moment for him makes him rooted in a meditative pause, thinking about the plasticity of culture. A plastic plastic is what oil, a substance, another hybrid substance made of oil, right? And so. Um, well, I don't want to be a spoiler. You need to read that. It's a graphic novel, by the way. It's a graphic text. 
using the rhyme of the ancient Varana as a, as I, as I said, as a pullover in order to make a contemporary, uh, a contemporary message, to give us a contemporary message in our fuel-driven modernity. All right. So, um, next please. Yesterday, Ghosh Babu was all over, and I'm bringing Ghosh Babu all over again. And I, uh, more so because uh, only four days back, on the 8th of March, Ghosh Babu, I'm talking of Amitabh, of course, and pardon my name is Prantik, I'm very parochial and very Bengali inside me, right? So, um, uh, it added to my puffed up, already puffed up Bengali pride when Ghosh Babu won. Um, the Erasmus Prize. Now, uh, you know, we talk about the Litzer Prize, Booker Prize, uh, Commonwealth Prize. This is a prize given for, right, for writers who um, write on climate change. And he won it on the 8th of March. No surprise why. Uh, it was Ghosh, Amitav Ghosh, who actually coined the word retrofiction almost three decades back, we are talking about. In fact, uh, he was one of, in 1992, I think, he wrote a review of um, a novelist from Saudi Arabia, um, a man named, uh, a writer named Abdul Rahman Munif. He wrote uh, uh, one of his first novels called The Sittings of Salt. And Amitabh Ghosh was re reviewed that book, reviewed that book. It's there in the Imam, his collection of essays called the Imam stories. So, in that review, uh, this is what he had to say. Uh, he, did, he said a lot of things, of course, but one of them, two of them I have, uh, I'm going to use a long quote. I've shortened, abbreviated the quote. What is that essay about? He talks about the oil encounter. The essay is titled Oil Encounter, in which he coins the word petrofiction. Petrofiction, the oil encounter and the novel. What is that essay all about? Well, Ghosh argues in this uh, rather polemical essay that there has been a kind of inexplicable silence between, uh, not just silence, a secretiveness, call it a conspiracy, among American writers uh, in their refusal or in their denial of the materiality, not just the materiality of oil, but of its um, discursive violence. The violence of geopolitics. We talk about American literature, how closely is it connected with American foreign affairs. Yeah. So, uh, the whole of American culture, the great American dream, as I was saying when I just touched upon Arthur Miller, uh, the whole American dream, the so-called American dream, is, uh, in not, is inexhaustible only because of the gridlock a long history of imperialism or new capitalism, if you please, uh, right from Nigeria to you know to Brazil, or for that matter, even Indonesia. You visit any of these places, what meets you, what meets the eye, like a toothpick in your eye, are what companies like American multinational companies, which are the Shell, Exxon, Mobil Oil. And this is what he says, this is what Amitav Ghosh points out, that despite the presence, the only presence of oil and particularly American multinational companies across the world, well, how is it that American writers have, uh, it has not, let's say, infiltrated into their literary imagination. So you have somebody like Tom Bull talking about the vanity of the bonfires, but hey, Ever since 1926, it was only Upton Sinclair who wrote the first, well, the first and one of the rare, <clears throat> one of the rare oil, American oil novels called Oil. Beyond that, there is very little of American literature or American fiction which tells us about how deeply their entire American culture and American dream is all about oil. So, to a great many, this is what Ghosh says, and he doesn't pull back his punches. He says, to a great many Americans, oil smells bad. You know, he's giving us the reason. It smells bad. It reeks of unavoidable overseas entanglements. 
we talk about foreign affairs, right? We are talking about American expansionist, new, new imperialist plans. We are talking about writers, American novelists, who despite the deep connections that their industrial society has had with oil extraction, he finds American writers suspiciously silent on the oil encounter. He holds them guilty for being complicit with the shenanigans of oil companies like Shell and their denial of the human cost, the human cost of oil modernity. He talks about the pornography of silence. Pornography of silence. That American, American writers, in being secretive, in keeping something that is obvious everywhere, are complicit, are complicit with, in a way, with American companies and American foreign trade policies. Well, in 2021, Ghosh revisited his own essay. In fact, he titled it as Petrofiction Revisited. We are talking about Ghosh writing Petrofiction in 1992 and then 2021, almost you know, 30 years. And there he says, um, he, he writes a foreword to an anthology of oil fictions. So what I'm trying to also suggest to you that between 1990, where Ghosh found very little oil writing or very little American literature on oil, um, and in these three decades, well, there has been there have been a lot of writings on oil, but between in three decades, therefore, uh, the world of the world of oil politics has changed, and so has oil fiction or what he calls petrofiction. In what way he says? Okay, I'll skip this part. He, however, yeah, just a minute. He does talk about, you know, how he wrote his first book, uh, Circle of Reason, one of the books, uh, Circle of Reason. And he talks, you know, that when he wrote the book, he was actually in Kerala. He was working in an institute in Kerala. And um, this was 1984. And what made him write something like Circle of Reason? Uh, he says... Um, how do we teach circle of reason? We talk, we we introduce, we read that uh, we read the novel as a kind of a prototypical post-colonial text, right? But you know, think about uh, the second section, the second section of circle of reason, one that is titled uh, uh, Rajas Passion. The whole of second section in that second section, Ghosh uh, takes the uh, you know he moves the story to a fictional oil emirate called Al Ghazira and shows how, once again, how uh, the, the, the greed and the corruption of, multi, of, an, of an U.S. oil company destroys the local life, the local culture, the Bedouin culture. What is also interesting that he talks about the migration of labor. He touches upon the migration of labor, including the one of the central protagonists, Ali, if you think about it. Right. And he gives this today is being reread by him as an example of not just diaspora matter, petro diaspora. Petro diaspora. So, um, all modern writings, friends, um, all modern writings are premised on both the promise and the hidden costs and benefits of hydrocarbon cultures. And um, so what about, uh, you know, we who uh, inhabit post-colonial locations? I'm standing. I'm standing. Or rather, do I have? We started at 10, no? Yeah. No? Yeah. I thought I was just speaking with oil and uh, all right. Okay. So uh, then in that case, so, okay, let's, uh, let's move fast forward. Please move the slides. Oh, forget the slides. Let it be. Let it be. I think there is a... 
Yeah. So, um, all that aviation fuel that I burned, not after the plane burned, you know, carrying me from <laughs> to Vijayawada and going from Vijayawada to Nagpur. Uh, seems to be now short change uh, in uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> All right. Is there Indian fiction on oil? Well, plenty. And this is one new area that I would open up uh, for our research scholars. Right. Uh, those of us, those of you who may be doing green or eco criticism, green studies, environmental studies, here is uh, a new area, very, very interdisciplinary, very, very uh, original and new. So, uh, to look at Indian fiction, Indian fiction on oil, for that matter, you know, again, the same question that Ghosh, Amitabh Ghosh posed to American writers about the invisibility of oil in their writings, one can actually look at the history of the Gulf. I mean, you think of Gulf and you think of Kerala. <laughs> yeah. So an entire economy of Kerala, in fact, has been propped up, you know, right? has been scaffolded and propped up on uh, the migration to Gulf. And it's uh, the remittances in dollars, you know, which I would call petrol remittances that have kept everybody happy in Kerala, isn't it? Uh, I, um, I mean, this is, you know, in the course of your research, sometimes you come up on a work like discovering a Golconda or discovering a Kohibu. One of my favorite reads of last year was this book uh, called Temporary People by Sir Maidno Deepak Kundi Krishna. Uh, it's his debut novel. He's a Malayali writer, right? And he, and, uh, he won the, an award also, which has an interesting title. The award that he won for this debut novel has an interesting title. It's called Restless Books Prize for New Immigrant Writing. I love that word, restless. <laughs> restless Immigrant, um, uh, sorry, Restless Books Prize for Immigrant Writing. You know, what is, uh, we talk about, di we have been talking about diasporic literature. So we've been, Adam has touched on, you know, uh, exile, home, identity, alienation, cultural assimilation or cultural alienation and assimilation. All of it has familiar tropes. Uh, what only crush, what rereading or reading only Christian's fiction, this particular book does, is to point out what I call oil's fetishization. And we are not talking of the, met the metaphoricity of oil, we are talking about the materiality, something that even Dinesh sir was trying to highlight yesterday when he talked about the how important it is to recognize not our waterways uh, metaphorically, but to take cognizance of its materiality, its physicality. So, in a, the same logic works here as well, all right, that we need to talk more of oil, not in terms of metaphors, all right, uh, something that uh, Susan Sontag does for diseases. No more metaphors here, right. In fact, it is uh, the materiality of oil that we find uh, richly embedded in Unni Krishnan's story which is called Temporary People. Why that name Temporary People? It is so, so apt. Temporary People are what, um, you know, they have a system called um, the Kapala system. The Kapala system is a nefarious underground illegal trafficking of human labor that continues to, that has happened right from the 1950s and the 60s to now. I'm talking particularly about the route from Kerala to the Middle East. And basically, you need a sponsor, sponsor to take who, right, from chemical engineers to your taxi drivers to your, you know, drillers, plumbers, nurses, right, a domestic helps, they are domestic helps, all of them, all of them traffic on uh, a system which promises you like the great American dream, the great Gulf dream, and then not only picks your pockets, but also leaves you sometimes starved, and also, and also in a in a sense, destroy, destroy. Why? Because you have no. There is an absolute. You know, there is a huge uh, problem of human rights violation, particularly when 
immigrant uh, immigrant laborers, especially from down south, go to the Gulf. So they're called guest workers, and therefore only Krishan calls them temporary workers. Now you see, now you don't, right? And where are, and and what is also noticeable? It's not just about writing about oil or pipeline people. They're called pipeline people. Immigrant laborers are called pipeline people, as if their very existence is in and out of pipes. Right. What for me uh, is very interesting is about this book is also the narrative mode. The narrative mode. Uh, it's a kind of a very surrealistic, hallucinatory mode of telling a story. Hallucinatory, precisely because oil itself makes. Um, the petrosphere, it, it kind of gives, uh, it creates an environment of menace, of terror, unfolding terror, unimaginable terror. And, and therefore, he spins a story about uh, the violence, the violence and the brutality of what he calls extractive regimes, extractive regimes. But you know what his, what his stories are? Well, his stories are not about hyper-realism. They are not realistic portrayals of what happens to the immigrant laborers in, in, in the Gulf. No. Uh, he tells, these are 28 actually short stories interlinked together by a common narrative, which is oil. Oil and its many functions. So we, in the stories, we read about construction workers who shape shift into luggage. Or what you put, you know, on the airports, we put uh, luggage tanks. So workers turning into, transmogrifying into luggage tanks, visas. Which ones? Work permits, not visas, work permits, right? Slave laborers, it's about stories about slave laborers who are cultivated in pods, artificially generated. Ooh, the best of bioscientists can think about that. Slave laborers, whose average lifespan, something that Margaret Atwood did in The Handmaid's Tale, women as reproductive slaves. Right. So here we are talking about, he's talking about, in a magic realistic way, he's telling us about a story where um, uh, there is an emir in a khalifa who has uh, used, not surprisingly, the brains, he's picked on the brains of a Malayali scientist named Musa. <laughs> Right to cultivate artificially cultivate migrant laborers whose average lifespan whose lifespan is 18 years. I mean they 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 are born 18 and they work for 18 years and then die. Or they are about stories where uh, uh, there is a woman who stitches back bodies that fall from construction sites. Ooh. So this is a case, you know, you could you could look at the way in which Unni Krishnan may, you know, may kind of wonderfully uses the magic realism that we kind of associate with Salman Rushdie, the writings of Salman Rushdie, as well as the highly satirical writing of somebody like George Saunders. I, I felt that way when I... Bizarro fiction, yes. So extraction fiction is bizarro fact fiction, right? And... The whole of Nigerian literature, I'm saying, I didn't have time to dwell on it. The whole of contemporary Nigerian literature, if you look at it, what is the prevailing, what is the dominant way, narrative mode? Magic realism. Why? Because petrosphere creates an atmosphere which is surreal. You know, you we, we do teach uh, uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Conrad's Heart of Darkness. And we talk about the surreal, we talk about the surrealness of the atmosphere, isn't it? So, uh, this is what also, uh, pet when you talk about petrofiction, it enters into the category of what we call critical indigenous studies. Critical indigenous studies. Who, where, uh, you think about migrant laborers, but then migrant laborers are from all, from where? Basically, low, underprivileged, lower caste, underprivileged people. So, you're talking about a petro diaspora, a petro diaspora where Powerless and uh, and helpless people are the ones who are being trafficked into this petro slave labor. All right. <sighs> Does oil therefore bring a crude awakening to our much deflated, 
humanities program, I come back to the question with which I started my talk. We talk about blue humanities, we talk about green humanities, we talk about, well, law humanities, digital humanities. Uh, the idea really to take forward for our own survival, I keep, never mind, I seem to be re-emphasizing and reiterating the point too much, but that's how passionately I feel. And it, it is basically to open the new, the, the what I call the new humanities, the doors and windows of new humanities open and to bring it into more dialogical interactions with many other disciplines. I'll conclude with one, just one example. No humanities. Ah, okay. Suddenly I said, who is ventriloquizing me? Yeah. Who is the other whose voice I can hear? Yeah. Okay. One example. You think about energy humanities, you think about petrofiction. We are right now on a campus which is interdisciplinary, which is multidisciplinary. I like to call the word contradisciplinary. So, why not introduce petrofiction or energy humanities in uh, the syllabus of chemical engineering? I would love to have a class with chemical engineers, right? where I would like to make them think of oil, not just in terms of oil cartels or pipelines, oil refineries, derricks, etc., but also make them think humanly about humans as petro-subjects and the environmental cost, the human and environmental cost of unbridled, relentless oil extraction. So, um, what... What I therefore propose at the, you know, my parting shot is that we need to energize humanities and move it from the direction of STEM to STEAM. I'm talking about our curriculum itself, from STEM to STEAM. And I'm deliberately using, punning on that word STEAM. The A should be there. And it is the A that should fuel, that should drive and energize not humanities, but I'm saying the science and technology fields as well. Yes, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's save English departments. By doing what? By breaking rules, by breaking disciplinary boundaries, by our own, by at least I hope I've introduced some very, very disruptive thinking, right? And, uh, um, Let's make the gentleman from the USA wait. So let's save departments from English departments from burning out or running out of steam. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening uh, a speech that you have uh, given, shared this morning. And we do understand that environment plays a very important role in shaping our lives, in sharpening our lives. And as part of the environment, along with all the living species, oil is very important. It is not just petrol, but it is also cooking oil and everything else. So we are once again very uh, grateful to you and uh, extend uh, hearty uh, and sincere uh, thanks to you, sir, for uh, speaking uh, at length uh, on this uh, novel topic. And we next move on into the online plenary. And uh, we have, uh, it is going to be the plenary talk of uh, Nicholas Burns, who teaches at New York University. And... Uh, Though we may be getting bugged, my dear uh, colleagues, but we have to, we need to tolerate with such, in, such things because, uh, you know, in the conferences, uh, such things are common. And uh, we, we can't escape because we have already paid our registration fees and uh, then uh, we are into it. So, and because we'll have to wait for the final, uh, what to say, that uh, black mark on a piece of white paper, which we call the certificate. So uh, all of uh, all of you should agree with me. So it, it is at least for that particular sake we need to stay. 
uh, i'm sure all of you are getting enlightened with all these uh, novel topics so once again thank you sir and before uh, i formally invite uh, professor nicolas burns uh, i have my colleague and good friend dr es sharmila sharmila associate professor from the department of english to read uh, the profile of our dear sir good morning sir are we audible good morning yeah so uh, i take great pleasure in sharing a few words about you to our uh, scholars and guests gathered here so um, nicholas burns teaches at new york university he is co-editor of the cambridge companion to the australian novel his previous books include the hyperlocal in 18th and 19th century literary space and he has previously written on anglo russian literary connections in victorian studies victorian institute journal and the bridget rooney edited anthology scenes of reading he has published in journals including mlq partial answers and studies in romanticism as well as in the new york times book review and other general interest periodicals he co-edited the american journal of australian and new zealand studies antipodes from 2001 to 2018 so we are very happy to have you with us sir and uh, we'd like you to uh, address the gathering sir thank you very much and thank you for inviting me i'm going to share my screen talk today as you see is on totality and totalitarianism the late ground university scholar avid gleason who was a historian of russia basically in his 1997 book totalitarianism the inner history of the cold war mentions that there is some overlap between totality in other words grasping or understanding the world the world as an integral whole and totalitarianism making it a whole in marxist and hegelian genealogy so gleason further commented that people on the political left were resistant to the classification of the soviet union as totalitarian that implies that they thought the word totalitarian was bad that it was pejorative that it was seen as a negative adjective where if calling a cultural form total or diagnosing it as aspiring to a totality was at least neutral if not a term of praise and this talk is going to be devoted to how these two words totality and totalitarianism are so close but are also so far when you can see the difference between totalitarianism and totality as a partisan one as the word totalitarian was first used by and of the fascist regime in italy in the 1920s and it's important to know that that was not just how a benito mussolini's machine was described by people opposed to it it was called it itself it was a self characterization totality as a phrase has been used largely by marxist philosophers such as ernst bloch and goyer lukash martin j a scholar who some of you may have read in his 1984 study of totality and marxist thought spoke of totality as a major concept in a western marxism distinguished by its independence from the really existing socialism of the soviet union in addition in gleason's very language that totalitarianism is a realization and i want us to think about that a realization of the total whereas totality is an aspiration to it may indicate that it is better if something is a dream than a reality that totalitarianism's realization of the dream of the total may be the bitterness of what the poet philip larkin called fulfillment's desolate attic i heard a bit of the previous talk by the way which i thought was very good and one of the issues with petro fiction and with anything about extraction extracting things from the earth is when you extract you are taking the potential of the earth and you are realizing it and that could be bad it might be better 
if it that potential is left unfulfilled. And of course, uh, what what the Anthropocene and what peak oil, of course, raises is uh, realization ultimately exhausting something. And so it's interesting to think of an aspiration that is never realized, that is totality, versus a realization, which is totalitarianism, which might be. Why totality is something that is uh, seen as imaginably fulfilling, whereas totalitarianism is seen as something constraining, uh, something about control. When seeking to find the place of literature and literary studies and debates about totalitarianism and totality, and the book I started with by the late Professor Gleason was a social science book that was not about literature. We should first discuss the relationship between literature and society, and this is something that you know, I'm sure everybody in the room has thought about a lot. Literature is made of stories and words that in turn have relationships as signifiers of imagination and sensation. Literature can be described in terms of form and feeling alone, as traditional literary criticism has often done, but literature also involves how language represents reality as well as the context in which literary works are composed and understood. The goal has always been to understand how context enables, supports, or ramifies literature, as we heard in the previous talk, without defining literature merely through social norms anterior to it. Very few literary critics, even the most politically committed, have ever simply reduced literature to politics. In other words, the goal has always been, how do we embrace social context in literary studies while avoiding social control. And to say that this is socially grounded, that this is relevant to society, is something very different than saying this is something that is socially controlled by a government or by an ideology. Uh, I am largely going to talk about the Western tradition because it's uh, what I know best. Uh, I know I have some knowledge of the Mahabharata and Ramayana, and I know it would be different if we talked about those works instead of Homer, but I am going to stay with the Western tradition here. I would say that the traditional canon of Western literature and how that canon is discussed has largely evaded totality. Aristotle, for instance, the great Greek uh, philosopher and literary critic, points out that Homer in the Iliad, the great ancient epic, represented only part of the Trojan War a small slice of time in that great conflict, and uh, uh, Homer only covers a few months in a 10-year war. And there was this great stress on the classical unities, the unities of time, place, and action. And those unities, by definition, concentrate only on small areas of representation, not the whole thing. So if you want to honor the classical unities, you don't do the whole war. You do a small bit of the war. That's what the work is about. Even when we talk about the epic, and we're used to using the word epic rather loosely as something that is long and big and has a lot in it and is total and verges on totality. But even in the epic, there is epic sweep, but there is not epic sprawl. But epics in the Western tradition are very organized and packaged and limited and not total. Aristotle also preferred myth as a field of representation rather than historical material, precisely because for him history was too concrete. History dealt with strictly what has been, whereas the mythical dealt with what might be, or what can be. In a way, Aristotle positions myth as closer to what we, we might call totality. But modern's ideas of totality emanating as they do from Hegel are very linked with history. And generally, when we talk about totality, we're thinking about totality as realizing some historical mission. And it's associated with Marxism, but Marxism's entire idea of history comes from Hegel and comes from debates around a German idealism in the early 19th century. And we have to remember in the early 19th century, Germany was not a unified nation. There was no Germany. There were a number of states that spoke the German language, but there was no Germany. And the Hegelian idea of history and totality very much takes that as a basis. And so totality is something that, again, isn't there yet, but might be.
Now, what about the novel? And we heard about the novel in the previous talk. And I'm going to touch, the previous talk mentioned magic realism, which I'm also going to touch on. The modern novel actually challenged certain norms of the Western tradition. English novels such as Henry Fielding's Tom Jones, which some of you might have read it with its representation of the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, or William Makepeace Thackeray, of course, uh, who had uh, some Indian connections, as I'm sure many of you know, his Vanity Fair, which depicts Napoleon's defeat at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Both those books included large-scale historical events in their purview, even though most of their focus was on the traditional novelistic material of love and romance and self-fulfillment and growing up and individual realization. In the 19th century, you had Victor Hugo's De Miserables, uh, with, you know, it's a very long book, but the climactic uh, a section is called The Idyll in the Rue Plumet, The Epic in the Rue Saint-Denis, and those are two streets in Paris. There's a, a, an idyll, uh, a small domestic scene taking place in one, and then there's a revolution taking place in the other street. And the idea that is that the novel as a form is both domestic and political. Uh, the modern novel has an expanded breadth when compared to the classical epic, that the modern novel opens a window on totality and isn't so constrained by the classical unity as it having to be just about part of something. The novel can try to be about the whole thing. The writer to realize this idea most in the 19th century is the great Russian novelist uh, Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy, uh, in his novel, War and Peace, which was published in the mid-1860s in Russian. In Tolstoy's novel, The Lives, Loves, and Yearnings of a Group of Young People, and I'm sure many of you have read this book, and you know uh, uh, Natasha Rostov and Pierre Bazukov and Andrei Volkonsky and that whole cast of characters, they are displayed against the background of Napoleon Bonaparte's invasion of Russia. So much of you know, Napoleon was this world striding figure, at least Europe striding figure. So much of ideas about uh, history in the novel in the 19th century in some way come from uh, Napoleon or the Napoleonic Wars. Except that history in Tolstoy's novel is not just background but foreground. In other words, as you know, if you've read the book, about half the novel is very like nonfiction, is expository passages about the history of the time. The novel contains detailed descriptions of major battles of the war, such as Austerlitz and Borodino, and has emperors and generals who actually existed as major characters. Uh, it's, uh, and those figures are side by side in the book with people who Tolstoy made up. And when you teach the book, as I am doing this semester, you have to kind of give a um, a uh, classificatory table to students of who's real, who's not, because Tolstoy really does it. He puts everything in there. War and Peace attempted to represent the totality of the society it depicted. We are far here from any Aristotelian sense of decorum, as the novel form envelops both fiction and history, and uh, the Anglo-American writer Henry James famously called War and Peace a loose, baggy monster, a loose, baggy monster, precisely because it was so total that it did not abide within the classical unities of time, place, and action, and it combined the traditional domestic material of fiction with a much larger political canvas. You might expect, given all this, that Tolstoy would be a proponent of totality and would want to see all of history as organizing itself into a total form and a total meaning. Indeed, I would say most people who are interested in history, and this is not just confined to the Marxist tradition, most people who are interested in history tend to want history to have a general meaning. It's, in a way, only natural if you're interested in something to want there to be, a, as the scientists say, a grand unified theory. Uh, Tolstoy, though, totally did not want this. He was against totality in the second epilogue to the novel. He uh, talks not just about history, but about the philosophy of history. 
And surprisingly, given what we've said, in the epilogue he takes a stand against totality. It is well known that Tolstoy upholds the great man theory of history. This is why Napoleon, who is so much more uh, charismatic and individual than anybody else uh, who opposed him, why he ends up losing. He, no one of his opponents was his equal, but because the great person is not the deciding historical force, Napoleon ended up losing. But Tolstoy goes much further, and he denies any sort of intention in history, and it's actually quite radical. And readers of the book, we have been so beguiled, I think, by Tolstoy's fictional canvas, and uh, so identified with the characters in the situation because of his skill as a writer that we uh, tend to underestimate how surprising his contention at the end is. He says that historical events occur because of a somewhat haphazard conjunction of infinitesimal, the very minute events, and that unlike not just Marxism or Hegelianism, but even in medieval Christian historiography, which believes that all history was organized by the providential appearance of Jesus Christ, there can be no grand design or overall meaning to history. Infinitesimals, concrete occurrences, can never add up to a totality. So to a story, sees all these historical events, but there's no way that they add up to an organized meaning. And to understand history is to understand the events and to know what happened, but uh, that there's no intention in them that can be grasped. Tolstoy's example suggests that a thoroughgoing social realism, and Tolstoy I would largely call a social realist, even though there are a lot of uh, moments in uh, his work of defamiliarized or estranged descriptions. Those of you who know the Russian formalist school of literary criticism, people like Viktor Shlotsky, uh, they get a lot of their examples of defamiliarization, estrangement, ostranyeny, as they would say in Russian, from uh, Tolstoy. But nonetheless, you would call him a social realist. And Tolstoy's sort of social realism is often contrasted to modernism. As it emerged in the early 20th century, modernism is often portrayed as privileging an inner psychological life and turning away from an objective representation of society. Yet totality as a concept involves more than just depicting a society. And you see this in the way Tolstoy brings in history, philosophy and history, philosophy of history more than as just background. Totality, by trying to assemble a multitude of details, by premising itself upon what the Hegelian Marxist tradition calls the concrete universal, and the idea of the concrete universal is very much uh, stands behind totality. Uh, and it, therefore, because you have this concrete universal that is at once specific but also general, it's not just representational realism. There is this potential inward aspect to it, an abstract aspect that is not just confined to the concrete, because it's not just the concrete, it's the concrete universal. Therefore, you can talk about Joyce's, James Joyce's Ulysses as being as much of a total novel as Tolstoy's War and Peace. Ulysses is famous as the most canonical text of literary modernism. Again, I'm sure many of you know this already. It's embrace of stylistic experimentation and foregrounding of linguistic reflexivity is well known. Yet the novel is also a detailed, accurate portrait of a specific place, Dublin, Ireland, at a specific time, June 16, 1904. And ironically, uh, Ulysses, uh, many of you know, it's, it's uh, parallels Homer's Odyssey, but Ulysses actually adheres much more to the class of the United States. The Odyssey goes all over the Mediterranean and goes over uh, many years, whereas Joyce is one day, one place. In other words, for all its transgressive and arcane qualities, Ulysses not only tries to get it right, but strives for the big picture. Ulysses is referring to reality, even though it's also being flamboyantly fictional. As one reader of the novel said, other novels are about something. 
Ulysses is something. And the novel of totality always gravitates from being just about something to being something. And one can say that as different as War and Peace and Ulysses are. One could say that about War and Peace just as much as one can about Ulysses. Totality in literature, as also attested in Tolstoy's case, seems to at once embrace the real in terms of breath, but also exceed the real in terms of aspiration. Now, what about totalitarianism? What about politics? We said at the beginning that totality is about hope, about aspiration. Totalitarianism is about realization. Notably, the world of Ulysses and people have talked about the politics of both in terms of uh, the specific political situation in Ireland, but also about the uh, the general philosophy of, of the novel. And people have said it's it's democratic, it's voluntary, it's not totalitarianism. But we have to remember, Joyce was writing about a nation colonized by Britain and publishing that novel in the very year that most of Ireland became effectively independent. And between 1904, when Ulysses is set, and 1922, and it was published, the Easter Rebellion of 1916 against British colonialism and the uprising of uh, a majority Catholic Irish population that previously had been oppressed colonially uh, occurred. As such, Ulysses can also be read as an anti-colonial novel, and it's stretching of routine social representation into a more challenging realm of reality as a challenge to colonial norms of representation. Indeed, given, and this is really striking, no, for Ulysses, no novel from Ireland had really entered the English literary canon. And you almost think that Joyce, Joyce's only way of writing himself and his nation into world literature and getting that notice in the English-speaking world and beyond was to be incredibly transgressive and excessive, to strain towards the total and burst the horizon that he was expected. An Irish writer, maybe, was a regional writer, a provincial writer, was a writer who was um, derivative, was second rate, was applying techniques that had already been explored by England and merely applying those to Ireland was being imitated. You know, Joyce said, I'm going to I'm going to break the mold. And that was a declaration of literary uh, independence and a refusal of realism. Now we go to Latin America and I promise you some magical realism. In the 20th century, Latin America had been independent politically for the most part since the 1820s. Again, had to do with the Napoleonic Wars because uh, Napoleon's invasions of Spain and Portugal weakened those countries so much that the uh, former colonies in the Americas uh, became independent. Uh, but in terms of the world cultural system, they were still seen as derivatives. There were many fine works by Latin American writers before the 1960s, uh, um, Machado de Assis in Brazil, Onetti in Uruguay, Borges, of course, in Argentina. But aside from those exceptions, Latin American writers were seen as regional, derivative, and realistic in intent. In the 1960s, you had a new generation of Latin American uh, writers, the boom generation, Carlos Fuentes, Julio Cortazar, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Mario Vargas Llosa, the one of whom is, one of them is still alive. Mario Vargas Llosa is, I think, 87, but still active. And the boom was not just an achievement of literary style alone, or even literary publicity, as much as people talk about that, but was also concomitant with an embrace of the total novel. And it's actually Vargas Llosa who writes about this the most. He wrote a uh, literary, kind of literary declaration of cultural independence in 1970. And he describes the total novel as going beyond aggressive provincialism to represent what Juan E. de Castro, who was a colleague of mine, called the total reality of a specific society or social group. And that's very much what totality is talking about, rendering the total reality. In other words, not just the external reality, not just the internal reality, not just the objective reality, not just the subjective reality, but the total reality. 
In other words, to meaningfully represent the region entail going beyond regional representation to a larger totality. You had to imagine that tendency to the universal to actually convey the regional. This is where magical realism came in. And I want to always has to tell students that most of those Latin American writers did not write magical realism, only in Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, uh, did uh, Boom Generation really do that. Nonetheless, the mode of magical realism really was what became influential in world literature and in places outside Latin America, especially as magical realism seemed to synthesize realism and fantasy, representational fidelity and aesthetic innovation. And what the previous talk was talking about, petrofiction and the role of magical realism and petrofiction was very much, I thought, quite well gesturing towards that. Uh, and this seemed to gesture to uh, all sorts of liberatory and inclusive strategies. Writers from colonized or subordinated identities use these methods of expression to affirm their own imaginative worlds and break any representational holes that the canons of the Western tradition had over their vision in the Indian subcontinent. As I don't need to tell you, writers like Salman Rushdie and Shashi Tharoor, I'm thinking in the case of Tharoor's case of the great Indian novel, uh, wrote total, which great Indian novel was very much an attempt to do uh, version of Joyce's Ulysses with uh, with uh, with the uh, cultural uh, heritage of Hinduism was very much an attempt to do that. Uh, they were total novels that did much to make not just Indian literature, Indian political and historical experience visible in the metropolitan West. And I know many people, until they read Midnight's Children, did not really understand what happened in the Indian subcontinent in 1947, and that novel actually educated them, which was kind of Rushdie's intent. And it was a, a case of how the total novel actually engenders a historical meaning through fictional means. And so you might think totality is this wonderful thing. And people who are imaging totality certainly have produced a lot of great work. Uh, yet there are problems. One of those, which I've not mentioned in the slide, but which should be very lively, is you have to be a good writer to good, do a good total novel. And a lot of people have sat down and said, well, I'm going to write a thousand page blockbuster and I'm going to sum up my culture and I'm going to make a big slash like Garcia Marquez did, but don't have the talent or don't have the vision or don't have the uh, commitment to their material. And they just produce a lot of bloated bad books. But aside from that aesthetic issue, there's also a political issue. Yes, the inclusive, liberating uh, impulse of these total novels is far from any totalitarian need to exercise social control. And so we might end up agreeing with Gleason's initial formulation that totality and totalitarianism, though close in sound and even meaning, are very different in concepts, as totality enables hope, whereas totalitarianism disappoints and forecloses in realization. And yet there are issues with totality. For a work of literature to make an impact, does it have to try to do everything? Are not to stick with the Indian example, the Malgudi novels of R.K. Narayan, with their chronicles of daily life in a small community, are not they as evocative as, and affirming as any total novel? And one can use examples from all sorts of places uh, in, in, in that way. Is not Chekhov as great a writer as Tolstoy? That's a similar question as as Narayan, even though Narayan and Chekhov are very different. But they're not trying to do totality, but they're great writers. What I call the hyper-local, the introduction mentioned, I did my book on the hyper-local. The hyper-local I talk about, and a few other people are talking about it, as a sense of specificity that is so minute, that is so particular, it can also be exchangeable, it can be mobile, it isn't stuck in one identity, it's small, but it's transferable, it's elastic. And the hyper-local may be able to get beyond, to use Marcus Joseph's phrase, aggressive provincialism, as much as a rhetoric of totality, precisely because it's, it's maneuverable. And totality can get stuck 
and you have a lot of these total novels that are like beach whales that don't that that have we left the ocean and are stranded on the beach and, and aren't able to fly aesthetically because they aren't maneuverable because they get stuck in their own mass. Uh, a book I am teaching now, I am teaching this week, is by the Polish novelist Olga Tokarczuk. Uh, her book, The Books of Jacob Tokarczuk, as many of you know, know uh, won the Nobel Prize in uh, 2018. And her book also brings up the issue that totality, precisely by extracting, and I use the term extracting here before I knew what the previous talk was going to be, but I think the issue... The danger of too much emphasis on totality is it's going to use up meaning and the way that too much extraction is going to use up the minerals in our planet. Precisely by extracting all that can be extracted from a given social reality can portray that reality monolithically in a way that is exclusive and overly organic. Joyce tried to avoid this by having his protagonist be a minority, be an uh, Irish Jew, obviously, which is not the majority in Ireland. Uh, Olga Kikarchuk in Books of Jacob is very interesting because she's telling the story of two very different communities, of Polish Christians and Polish Jews, and she even has a few Muslims. She's, in fact, very aware of Islam. Uh, Islam is very much present in the book. And she writes about them that affirms the traditions of all, all of these people, but also opens them up to each other, showing her engagement in what the Nobel Prize citation for her work calls crossing boundaries as a form of life. And she's very aware she's writing this big book, but she's also aware that a fragmented totality and an imprecise totality actually can mitigate the totalizing tendencies that tend towards the totalitarian, that the fragmentary can actually be democratic, even if it is potentially um, confusing and potentially uh, can be a bit cacophonous, can be a bit um, just difficult to understand and um, um, multivocal, but that fragmentariness actually can ward off the potential congealing quality of totality. We should not total totality. I don't know whether you, you have this idiom in, in English in India, but uh, here in the U.S., uh, when uh, we're driving a car, we're on the road and we have an accident, and that car is totaled, that means it's totally destroyed and it cannot run again, or it cannot run again unless you take it to the garage and, and spend a lot of money and, and try to, to, to get it back. And it's interesting that we have this very vernacular use of total meaning when he finished. My mission in this talk has been to celebrate totality by while avoiding the disastrous finality of the total. And it's this basic issue that totalitarianism is used of regimes like the fascist regimes, which um, not only you know murdered billions of people, but tried to make people conform to a social ideal. Whereas totality is supposed to evoke a social ideal without make, making people conform to it. So I want to celebrate totality while avoiding the disastrous finality of the total. I want to encourage social context without succumbing to social control. It's very important, I think, if you're doing historicist criticism, political criticism, post-colonial criticism, decolonial criticism, you are trying to do that. You are trying to foreground social context without using criticism as an instrument of social control. It has been to show how modern fiction has tried to represent communities as a whole. And so many of these writers are writing about people who haven't really been written about before. It was true of even Tolstoy because the Russian novel was so new. And they were all putting their own experience on the map. Yet also they want to allow for just fragmentation 
and difference, and celebrating the total while avoiding the totalitarian is, uh, 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 to my mind, the best way of doing this. I am going to unshare my screen right now, and uh, yeah, you're seeing me. Um, okay, good. I'm going to unshare my screen, and um, you know, hopefully, there'll be some time for questions uh, or discussion. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Nicholas. That was uh, interesting. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Professor Nicholas. Uh, that was very interesting. Your take on totality and totalitarianism in literature. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, I I do have a few hands. Uh, you'd be able to answer a few questions. I I hope you're not taking yes. up your time. Yeah, just a moment, yes, sir. Please. Yeah. So in the beginning of your talk, uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Professor. I can't hear at all. Oh, I can't. I can hear the question. So could you repeat the question? Yeah, okay, you might want to come closer. Good, good morning, morning, Professor. In the beginning of your uh, talk, you just mentioned totalitarianism is a realization of the total. Yes. If this uh, definition is uh, of uh, totalitarianism, it is not uh, wrong. I said realization of the total is not wrong. It doesn't look very, very wrong. But totalitarianism, in my understanding, I see, is an understanding either you are in it or out of it. That's sorry, where I'm it becomes not, wrong. I'm just not really hearing. Could you repeat the question? Could you be a bit louder? I, I'm just not quite making out what you're saying. Uh, totalitarianism. You are just yes. uh, yeah. You are trying to explain realization of the total. Yes. If yeah. if, well, if it's I so, mean, if it's yeah. so, it's not I, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. The the talent here. It's uh, you know, they're just because words are similar. Don't think they aren't. Don't necessarily mean the same thing. And certainly the way that totality has been talked about in literature is that people do that totality fully avoids the danger of our tyranny. And I guess I see where the 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 common denominator between totality and totalitarianism is Trying to envelop everything in one space. When you say everything is part of one form, that can become a problem, even if that form is aspirational and capacious and not repressive and constraining. So I recognize that the words in the way we use them are opposite, but I think the verbal resemblance, and I, I was not the one who thought of that, that was uh, Dr. Gleason. Uh, is um, is interesting, and uh, you know, just to expand on the genesis of what Leeson was saying. Leeson was saying that in the Cold War political science world, people talked about totalitarianism, and it was generally uh, the Americans calling the Soviet Union totalitarian. But if you go over to the English department or the philosophy department, people are talking about totality in a very different way. And it's interesting to try to bridge those two worlds and uh, try to bring those two worlds in dialogue with each other, maybe interrogating, interrogating each world's use of those terms and uh, trying to uh, ramify them and trying to see if they stand up to uh, juxtaposition to the other world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Professor. You Yes, that was uh, a very interesting uh, uh, talk to listen to, and uh, we're happy that you could answer the few questions that came your way. So, uh, is there any, any, are there any more questions? Yes, there is one more question, Professor. Okay, thank you. Greetings, Professor Nicholas. 
Thank yeah. you so much. And you oh, talk about uh, internal, external, subjective, objective, and totalitarianism. Would you make it clear, uh, very short? I I'm sorry. I'm still. I'm still not hearing. Could you repeat the question? Uh, greetings, Professor Nicholas. You yes. talk about internal, external, subjectivity, objectivity in totalitarianism. Would you elaborate that? Yes. Well, I mean, I think this is very much their tendency in recent criticism, in recent theory, uh, of um, talking about, especially actor network theory, the work coming from Bruno Latour, the work coming from speculative realism, to talk about the, the non-human actor and to shift the spotlight from subjectivity. Traditionally, the Hegelian Marxist tradition has always valued subjectivity. It has seen subjectivity as the motive force of history. I think, you know, even in something like War and Peace, just to take that very obvious example of War and Peace, you need both subjectivity and objectivity because you have human feeling, including human relationships, and you have individual choices, but you also have these historical events that the novel is arguing can't really, at, at, or at once, every action changes them. It's kind of like the butterfly effect. Every time a butterfly uh, spreads its wings, history might be changed, but also no one person could say, I'm going to change history, I'm going to make history the way I want it, as Napoleon tried to do. And so there is objective, there is something, there are things subjectivity cannot do, and those things are close to the objective. And also there is such a thing, and those go, but this goes back to people, postmodernism and deconstruction and so on, there is such a thing as reality. And I think Ulysses, Joyce's Ulysses, is a very interesting case of that because it is the transgressive, modernist, innovative novel par excellence. But it very much assumes that there is an objective reality. You can look up in the newspapers and you look at the old newspapers and you see every detail that Joyce has put in the novel is accurate, even as the conception of the novel is flagrantly mythic and flamboyant. So uh, I think, I don't think subjective and objective align. You can't say totality is subjective, totalitarianism is objective. I do think that anything aspirational involves subjectivity, and anything that is just fulfilled and complete there's no need to be subjective so much. So it maybe tends to equate, you might tend to equate subjectivity to totality and objectivity to totalitarianism, but I wouldn't want to make do that completely because I am not against objectivity, and I don't think the uh, works I've talked about are against objectivity. I believe in objectivity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, Thank that you. answered our question. So uh, we're really happy that you could come and spend some time sharing your views on totalitarianism. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So that was indeed a minuscule of history of English, history of English literature because Sir has... Uh, you know, while dealing with uh, the postmodern uh, elements, uh, he has taken us uh, uh, through long strides of, uh, you know, all almost all the writers uh, hailing from different uh, nationalities and countries. So thank you, uh, Professor Nicholas Burns, once again. And now we break for tea, and tea is served on uh, this side. For me, it is left side. For you, maybe it is right side. Again, the same confusion that we had yesterday, but I'm just pointing out by hand. So please go for tea and uh, uh, we'll be back into the same hall at 10.45, sorry, 11.45. 11.45, we'll be back. So please, uh, five minutes is extended. I think yesterday we just had 10 minutes, but five minutes is extended. So please go for your tea and then we'll be back at 11.45. Uh,
So thank you, friends, for being here on time. And we move on into the next plenary session. Uh, we have uh, Professor Kamal Mehta, Professor, Department of English, Saurashtra University, Rajkot, Gujarat. And uh, he will be enlightening us uh, uh, on the topic uh, relevance of the application of Indian classical literary theory. And before I welcome our dear sir, I invite uh, Mr. Shubhakar, Assistant Professor, Department of English, to introduce uh, sir to the gathering. Thank you, madam. I am indeed privileged to introduce you, Professor Kamal Mehta, Department of English, Saurashtra University, Rajkot, Gujarat. He has more than three decades of experience in the field of academics as well as administration. By now, he has guided 24 more students in receiving PhD degrees. He completed two major projects and three UGC minor research product projects on Rajarao, Naipal, Gujarat and Indian English literature and short stories. He has published eight books by now, 20 research papers and literary translations and one more book is awaiting for publication to be released this month. He is a member BOS, MS University, Vadodara, North Gujarat University, Dr. Ambedkar Open University, Ahmedabad, and the Central University of Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Gujarat Technical University, Ahmedabad. In addition to academics, he has already served more than five years for the board of BCUD and IQAC director for more than six years. Now I request Kamal Mahata sir to start that address. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It speaks. The profile is very brief because uh, it's not that uh, sir has got nothing, but uh, you know uh, because sir has sent that uh, what is very important as part of a research scholar and an erudite scholarship. So it shows that he has got lots of uh, a learning. And sir, we are very happy to have you. And over to sir. I will directly start to save time and also to have some more time for the introduction. Before I begin, I convey my heartfelt gratitude to Sunalini Madam and the Department of English and KL University for inviting me and taking so much of care here on the campus. <coughs> my topic is the relevance of the application of Indian classical literary theories and my focus is on Sanskrit. Fortunately, now because of NEP, now this is certainly coming in the mainstream, but for decades, rather I would say centuries, it has remained ignored and we have lost something very significant so far as our cultural development of the country is concerned. In Sanskrit, it is said that Sahit Ke Sangeet Kala Gita Sakshat Vashu Pucha Vishana Gita a human being must have interest either in Sahitya, that is literature, or in Sangeet, or in Kala. If there is a human being and he doesn't take interest in any of the three, he is not He is Sakshat Pashuk. He is an animal without horns and tail. So how literature is important for humanities, for the society, that is what it says. Mamata Acharya, he speaks of what does literature do? And he says, <coughs> you know, he refers to several things. I want to focus on a couple of things. He says, Kavyam Yashase Arthakrute, Yavahara Vide, Shiveta Rakshataye, Sadhya Paranirvutaye, 
dance something to tayo they say you jay we can keep aside other things but at least it gives us what is called vyavaharik gnan wisdom knowledge to live a life as a human being to be an asset to the society be useful to others because if we are not culturally rich if we are not civilized then what is the purpose literature civilizes us and this is the perception of not only india but perception of even classical theories of the greek latin also my <clears throat> major hypothesis on which i am going to deliver my talk is that it is you know a proven fact so i still take it as a hypothesis because new generations will have to look into it that literature is a tool it can be used for any purpose if it is used for good purpose then it contributes positively if it is used for other purposes literature can be used songs music in fact wherever cultural if i i visited couple of other naxal prone areas and there naxalism is being promoted through culture through literature through music through dance so it can be misused also it can be used and it can be misused and therefore if you want to make a human being a human being what kind of human being you want the person to be for that we also have to teach them how to interpret it how to use literature how to understand literature and there in fact indian poetics comes to our help i now start my paper india came in contact with the english literature in particular and other european literatures in general due to the colonial rule since 1835 due to the english education as per the plan of macaulay english literature has been being taught extensively in all the universities of the country even after independence there has been no change in it in english literary studies by and large the students are taught the interpretation and evaluation of the literary text by applying one or the other western theories and perspectives the matter hasn't ended here even the students of the regional indian literatures are also taught the western theories and their application on indian literary texts of course teaching western theories and their application on our texts is certainly a welcome step i am not against this we have to allow anything to come to our country if we are using western theories there is no harm indian students must learn evaluating indian literatures from external perspectives also however when our students are taught evaluating our literatures in the western fashion then knowingly or unknowingly we are also teaching them to fashion ourselves in the western ways and shaping or forming our culture values and ethos also from the western viewpoint western viewpoint is fine in the west it has to be either adopted adapted modified and then taken up which we do not do in this context this fact cannot be ignored that the indian literary and critical traditions are older than or at least as old as western literary and critical traditions however since these traditions are not made the part of our university curricula extensively and the other non indian traditions are made extensive use of in curricula our students have been losing track of indian ethos values approaches and perspectives and so their intellectual and cultural development remains lopsided the values which made us great are getting eroded in his 1819th speech swami vekananda you know spoke for 7 minutes or so and he said why he is proud of being an indian and he speaks of different values those values because we do not apply our theories for interpreting our literature we are getting and you know, we are losing them 
something which we should have been proud of unfortunately we are you know not looking at it with lot of pride now if indian students of literature do not know anything about indian poetic traditions it is both unfair and undesirable if priving our students of the millennium old indian intellectual and cultural traditions is a grave blunder on our part many scholars of the country who maintained their hegemony on curricular development did not let it be the part of curricula because they thought that indian poetic theories are irrelevant or they were irrelevant and hence of no use this hypothesis of them is based either on their ignorance or the colonial prejudices prejudices against this literary and critical traditions many scholars do think even today that indian poetics cannot be applied on contemporary texts for the reasons of criticism they feel that indian poetics is outdated and other literary theories are much ahead in time and have already marched far ahead in the world since the other ones are more reliable only they should be taught under such circumstances it is the need of the day to investigate into this phenomenon we do not reject their views but let us examine it open mindedly whether they were right or they are not right into this phenomenon and arrive at a rational diagnosis of it moreover there is a need to alter this view by example if we simply preach that we should teach indian poetics and we do not show models to them again there is no use so we have to alter this view by example that is by creating models of analysis of indian theories not only in indian texts but also on canonical english texts to prove that indian poetics is relevant even today and it has universal significance too the second part of my paper is i have applied this theory on animal farm because it is known by most of the students fortunately some university in india and abroad have started offering courses on indian poetics and also ancient classical indian literatures the nep 2020 also aims at encouraging and promoting this on a mass scale so now we hope for its decisive implementation and expect encouraging outcome of the same in national interest in near future a few universities also offer how to evaluate the literary works from these perspectives at present fortunately we do have scholars in the country who are familiar with indian literatures as well as poetic traditions at the same time this is also a fact that a very few of them have tried to systematically analyze literary texts from indian poetic and critical traditions in a manner that can win the confidence of the contemporary readers hence there is a need to revive these traditions in a convincing manner by presenting them with specimen models of their application on text it is the need of the day that we convince the academia in the field of humanities that not only indian poetic theories are relevant today in applying them on contemporary indian literatures but also that they can be applied on western texts further when they are applied on them it is interesting to know the result of the application we arrive at new interpretations of them and develop new understanding of life and reality around us for example hamlet is being seen as a tragedy but when you apply rasa theory then karun is not a central ras veeras is a central ras and therefore is not a tragic hero this is because you apply the indian poetic theory we had similar experiences when the western parameters were applied on indian texts in the initial periods of colonization for example when we started applying western theories we started interpreting sita as a very meek wife very docile and not at all strong now this is not true if we read the entire ramayana then sita is not weak at all she is a very strong woman she has identity and many more things but i will not go into it because it will divert me otherwise in other direction so the moment we apply other cultural theories they will give new interpretations those who have applied indian aesthetic theories have applied particularly the rasa and dhvani theories for instance ms sen sangeeta mohanty 
has done her PhD research on Hamlet from the Indian perspective from a foreign university. Such efforts are good and path showing. Still, such efforts are very few and in their initial stage only in terms of both the quality and quantity. We do trace some such efforts in last 170 years because since 1860, Indian critics like Michael Madhusudan Dutt, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Sri Aurobindo, Rabindranath Tagore, etc. have given their Indian response to Western literature. All of us can refer to you know, S. K. Das's book, you know, Indian Ode to the Western Wind, which is nothing but how Indians have responded to English literature. These people whom I refer to just now, they have referred to primarily various texts by Shakespeare like The Tempest, Othello, King Lear and so on and so forth. And Bankim Chandra has extensively written on them and we can find it in his 1872 book Bankim Rachanavali Volume 2. A systematic and elaborate study of Shakespeare is seen in Hamlet Unveiled by Rentala Venkata Subarao. The question is, how can it be done? In this regard, as M.S. Kushwaha mentions, the scholars must make certain modifications in their application because they cannot be applied as they are because Indian theories did not come into existence for helping readers in interpretation. We have to see this basic difference. All the Indian theories are, they have come into existence primarily to guide the writers rather than readers and therefore the entire angle is different. And so when we are using this for interpretation, naturally we have to make some modifications, meaningful modifications. <coughs> they rather guide the poets or authors in their compositions. Kapil Kapoor also believes that some composite models need to be developed for their more effective and meaningful application. He writes in his, in his book Literal Theory that a need is felt for a composite analytical framework quite contrary to the insistence in the tradition on a strict adherence to one theory alone. A practical analysis model should be strong enough to investigate all the major dimensions of a literary composition. Such a model shall lean on more than one theory and draw its categories elactically from as many theories as need be. He even states, I unquote here, yeah, he even states that such a composite model is available in tradition itself and shows the model of analysis presented by Rajashekhar. 10th century Indian critic in his book Gavya Mimansa. All the Indian theories have emerged from their preceding theories. It is not like Western theories that every theory is independent. All the Indian theories, there are seven Indian theories, major ones, each one has gradually emerged out of the previous ones. You, you have to do khandan and mandan the previous theories and then only you have to say something new. If you do not say something new, you have no right to exist. Then you either be with them or remain silent. You have to take the things further. So in that way, every theory is interrelated. Whatever somebody has said, I need not say. That was the perception. <clears throat> and thus, have close connection among them. Hence, one need not confine oneself to any single theory alone and need not mind taking ideas from other theories also while applying a specific theory. On the other end, most of the contemporary Western theories are ideology specific and therefore two theories are difficult to combine and apply unless they are having similar premises. As a result, there is a trend that one can apply one theory alone at a time on a work. The ancient Western theories like that of Aristotle and Longinus they are not ideologically, they are, they are also ideologically neutral and, and therefore they are content centric and hence it is possible for us to apply Aristotle Longinus both together because they are like us and therefore they can be applied but all the contemporary western theories are altogether different. There are four 
Indian theories which can be applied exclusively on text. I say if you take only one, it is possible to apply it. Out of seven, four are so you know complete theories. Rasa theory, Alankar theory, Vakrokti and Dhvani. And, and you would be surprised to know that all the four deal with four major aspects. You have author, you have text, you have context and you have reader. Rasa theory specifies itself on reader. Alankar centers itself on the text only. Vakrokti on author and Dhvani on context. So they are dealing with how you know, each aspect is important and it can be interpreted in that way. There are four Indian theories which can be applied exclusively on texts to have a complete analysis of them. They are Bharat Muni's Rasa theory, Bhamaha's Alankar theory, Anand Vardhan's Dhvani theory and Puntak's Vakrokte theory. The other theories can be employed along with these theories to explore some other significant aspects of the text. For example, Vaman's Riti theory, which is exclusively discussion of the style. And he says that style is the soul of poetry. <laughs> riti, Atma, Kavya, Siya. And Vishishta Padarachana Riti. Definitions are so simple. which discusses the language and style of the text. Kshemendra's Auchitya theory, which evaluates the propriety and decorum of 27 types. There are 27 types of Auchitya literature, and he enlists all of them. And Pandit Jagannathas Ramanita theory, which looks at the beauty of a literary text. This can be added to explore some other specific aspects of the text. In addition, Indian literary theories also discuss the merits and demerits. There is an elaborate discussion of guna and dosh. Guna of Sahitya. Sahitya means, you know, when Bhama defines poetry, he gives a very simple definition. He says, Shabda Arthav Sahitav Kavyam. Kavya is nothing but a harmonized unity of Shabda, that is word and meaning. When they are Sahita, when they are together, hand in hand, in harmony, then it is literature. Whatever is Sahita can become Sahitya. The word Sahitya has come out of Sahut, Sahit, where word and meaning go together. Similarly, Uchit becomes Auchitya. Whatever is appropriate is in fact the other thing, like that. So, merits and demerits are also discussed and they are merits and demerits of Shabda and merits and demerits of meaning. A very elaborate discussion is there. Then we have Dandi. Dandi has given the idea of ideal poetry and his book is Kavya Darsha, Adarsha Kavya, an ideal poem. Which one is an ideal poem? And he elaborates the entire book and this is a Sangraha book. Where he would not give examples, there will be sutra only. Somebody else comes and writes different books and then they explain. It is up to the researcher to bring about creative and meaningful employment of those theories. That liberty we have. The textual and stylistic discussions of the text can be further mingled with the exploring of the construction of the Indian understanding of life and individuals in the text. When we are applying these theories, we are also applying our understanding of life. How do we look at human behavior? How do we look at so many other phenomena with which we are associated? When we combine these two, then only it becomes in a proper you can say, application of theory. Indian poetics does have the discussion of the kinds of heroes in literature. There are different kinds of protagonists. And how you can categorize your elaborate discussion. The analysis of these aspects will bring into discussion what Indian, what India appreciates or admires and what it does not. When Aurobindo was responding to Macbeth and Othello, then he described them as barbarians. Now, if they are barbarians, then you cannot sympathize with them. They are not tragic heroes. Why? 
because for him if somebody because three dakshini is very important in indian culture if a husband kills his wife he cannot be admired he cannot be admired because ill treatment of the woman is not at all allowed ravan may have all the qualities he doesn't have three dakshini therefore he is a rakshasa even macbeth atithi devo bhava he kills his atithi who was good to him who was fatherly to him and he kills him for selfish motives how can you sympathize with it this was his initial response why because by interpreting in this way by teaching this kind of interpretation what we are doing is we are cultivating in the readers indian ethos and indian values but if we start appreciating in spite of this then we are also encouraging which also we have to take very seriously we are encouraging such behavioral patterns which we would not otherwise sanction even by applying this theories and philosophies on western texts we would be critically evaluating their problems and crises from our viewpoint we have sufficient scope to diagnostically examine the social psychological domestic and personal individual issues of humanity from our angle india offers guidance for all types of human issues and our critical writings must reveal them by applying our theories and philosophies on text for example ecology india has its own philosophy of handling nature if it can be promoted things will change even the west will have done so many things how we treated nature and how we in fact preserved nature the indian perspective that is which indian values and ethos get manifested in them can be revealed to bring out indianness it would enrich our students understanding of our cultural values and make them more at home in assessing their own problems as well all these things would emerge as the result of the application of indian poetic literary and intellectual theories on literature for example why does the revolution fail in george orwell's animal farm as its own marxist freudian lacanian and sartre in explanations in addition to many other social psychological explanations in the same way there can be an indian explanation also which is based on ages old indian study of human life in the world let us now apply the indian literary theory of dhwani on george orwell's classic novella animal farm written in 1945 and critically examine how it works and also see whether its result is relevant or not anand vardhan classifies dhwani into three categories and the third category called rasa dhwani there are three categories you have vastu dhwani dhwani is meaning one is vastu dhwani that is meaning emerging out of the words literal dictionary you can say then it has alankar dhwani dhwani emerging out of the diction the way the language is used and dhwani emerging out of your overall experience of the text so dhwani the meaning that emerges out of the overall experience of the text is called rasa dhwani and that is uttam dhwani other is madhyam and adam so george orwell's animal farm has rasa dhwani in it therefore from our perspective it is an excellent work of which has the capacity to generate in among the readers what is called rasa dhwani how i would say dhwani is also called anu ranan echo that when you read something gets echoed in your mind you are reminded of so many other things because we have literal meaning we have implied meaning we have suggested meaning and he is referring to suggested meaning that if a text has only one meaning let it be read by anyone it has only same meaning then it is a very poor work of it because then there is no different between shastra shastras can have only one meaning mathematical texts cannot have multiple meanings 
physics text cannot have multiple meanings. They have only one meaning. You have to understand that meaning only. But in literature, there can be multiple meanings. So if it has only one meaning, it is Adam Kavya. Very poor quality Kavya. If there is a Kavya, that is literary text, not only poem, which has meaning, but the way the meaning is conveyed is more important. That is, the text has a meaning, but the manner in which it is conveyed, if Dhvani is emerging out of that, it is called Alankar. That what you say is while very common, but the way you say it is important. Therefore, poetry often says what we also experience, and we are impressed by the manner in which it is said. And therefore, it has alankar, which still depends on the text. But the greatest dhvani, the highest quality of dhvani, is one which does not depend on the text at all. The meaning that you derive out of the text, in fact, cannot be associated with the text. There is nothing in the word, there is nothing in the paragraph, the stanza, which you can say that is the meaning emerging out of. It becomes instrumental, catalyst. And then it generates new meanings into you. When they are there, then that is the highest quality of money. And animal farm also has that type of money. And they become in fact classics. They have what you what Bonjainas calls universality. It conveys meaning to all, everywhere, anytime. The reader is able to see new meanings having strong connection with the text as far as implications are concerned. The background and the life experience of the readers play a powerful role in capturing dhoni of the text. The reader has a role to play. How experienced he is, accordingly he will have different dhoni. Your capacity to capture dhoni, it, it is not there in the text. Text is constructed in such a manner that it has the capacity to generate. But it depends on readers. If readers are not well, well equipped, they will not be able to get dhvani. And so when new reader is there, there is new meaning. I will skip a few things and directly go to interpretation part. <clears throat> when animal farm begins, there is a character called Old Major who blames man, that is human being, for the deplorable fate of his fellows, that is animals. He assures them in his address that they can have a better life only when they would remove him, that is man. You have to eradicate this othering. This othering is not an Indian tradition. We do not make anyone the other. This binary is not an Indian tradition because we believe in integration. There is integration everywhere. But because of so many contemporary we are seeing division, 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 division. And this is called in Gita as Veda Buddhi, which is a poor quality Buddhi. We need to develop a Veda Buddhi. We have to see similarity and differences. Here, the Western theory is what they teach us is, they teach us how to see dissimilarities among those who are similar. Different types of men, different types of women different types of childhood, different types of problems. So everywhere what we are doing is, we are dividing, number one. Secondly, we are setting one against the other. This othering is a major issue and therefore there are conflicts in the society. Because what we keep on associating ourselves with, every now and then, you know, we have been developing the culture of complaints and culture of connivance. We have series of complaints to make. We don't have series of solutions. India teaches us how to find a solution to a problem. We have to understand the question also, issue also, but only describing issue is not enough. You have to come with solution also. And therefore, he is also identifying man as the enemy and how he looks at it. The soul of England is fertile, I quote. Its climate is gold. It is capable of hoarding food in abundance to an enormously greater number of animals than now inhabited. This single farm of ours would support a dozen horses, horses, 20 cows, hundreds of sheep, and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. I unquote. He invokes them for a rebellion 
bringing solidarity amongst themselves, forgetting the difference of their species. This is what he says in the beginning, that we should forget how one is hen, other is horse. He distinguishes between man and animal, but that is very certain. In binary terms, and gives them some alarms for avoiding any issue. I quote, whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. These are superficial definitions. They are not going to help in longer run. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Even when you have conquered him, do not adopt his vices. There are seven commandments, in other words, constitution or manual of practice is prepared by the pigs who take up the leadership as the old major was a pig. The pigs were perceived as the cleverest among all the animals. Again, you know, the way we have caste and class and whatever, here the pigs, in fact, they get the leadership naturally based on birth. Everything all right for some time, but then corruption in conduct enters. The leading group, that is the pigs, did not actually work but directed and supervised the others. They start misinforming and misguiding the others in the farm. They become self-centric and power-hungry. So they start drifting away from their ideas. And in the end, the farm is significantly worse off for its non-pig inhabitants. Now, all are not equal. Some are more equal. The pigs are more equal. Critics have found the novella to be an allegory on the Bolshevik revolution and its result. But as we are Indian readers, we are able to see many other things. For example, we can see the way caste system deteriorated in India. Here you find an example. If pigs dominate, the domination is coming from birth. If you are born a pig, you are superior. If you are born something else, you are something else. Secondly, You know, the leaders who lead, who give vision, why they are not able to sustain their followers to continue to walk on the same path? Or why followers are not able to follow the leader successfully for a longer period of time? Again, this is an example of that which we have to explain. Madam, how much time? Please tell me. Five minutes? Because I can... I can skip and five minutes. Okay. And there, you know, in order to resolve any problem, you need to understand your problem very well. Your diagnosis of the problem is necessary. If the doctor is not able to diagnose your disease properly, no medicine. And in this, India also has its own way of looking at reality and interpreting reality. When do we fail to understand reality? That particular thing is also reflected in Animal Farm. One of the suggestive meanings, that is Dhvani, of the novella is the moral and ethical fall of an individual. Why and when does an individual fail and fall? We believe that there are six main enemies, what we call Shat Ripu, of human beings, which are Kam, Krodh, Lobo, Madha, Matsya. Whenever you look at any reality, if it is colored by any of the six, either Kam or Krodh or Mat or Matsya, then you can never understand reality properly. Your understanding, your diagnosis would be lopsided, incomplete. And when your diagnosis is incomplete, your solution is bound to be shortly. Bolshevik revolution, Marxism promised, you know, a classless society. State would wither away. But actually, state became the main capital agent. Within 70 years, Russia proved to be a major flop show. And in the world, in so many countries, Marxist governments came into power. 
but not a single country has been able to show a model that this is modern society. That means the theory was not correct. The theory was devised very hectically, in a great hurry, without properly understanding human being in his behavior, and therefore the program failed. The novella also has a suggestive meaning on why promising circumstances also fall to yield the expected result. I am simply suggesting, for example, third Panipat. Maratha sword was invincible. Afghans were in no position to defeat Marathas. And therefore, you know, a big chunk of Maratha soldiers went to Kurukshetra for Snan. They thought that we would be very easily defeating the Afghans of Delhi. Overconfidence. And what happened? Everything was in favor of Marathas, but they lost within one day. Third Panipat lasted for a day only. The moment, you know, Sadashira Bhav fell, there was running here and there among the Maratha army and India lost. Why? You know, something which is in our favor, we tend to lose. There again you have Indian way of looking at the whole thing and animal farm also reveals the same. We don't believe that ends justify the means. We believe that if the ends are noble, the means are also supposed to be noble. So this Marxist ideology, why did it fail? Because it, it was open to even evil means to attain larger good, which will never succeed for a longer time. It is also the dhvani of the text that the animals had no vision for reconstructing their society and if at all there was any vision, it was quite crude, faulty, incomplete and impracticable. If your entire drive is to bring something down, you can succeed in bringing down anything, but you will not last for a long time. You need something for reconstruction. If you do not give it, if you do not have Swapna, for example, whether it is Ram Raj or whatever, there are so many Swapna, Republic, we need to give it. Unfortunately, the old major could not give. He simply thought that if man is out of the animal farm, it becomes man or farm, or problems are over. He does not know that the, program, the problems do not emerge from the body. The problems emerge from the minds, from the brain, from the heart. And he did not address this at all. It is also one more dhvani of the text on why does the leader fail? This is one of the versions that any great leader can also fail in the course of time. Further, it also, I am not going into it because that students can explore further. This text also reveals the dhvani on how grand dreams of visionaries get betrayed and how they are betrayed. All big sopnas, they are betrayed and human history is full of such betrayals. Is there any universal diagnosis of why betrayals take place and how they take place so that you can take care of it? This text suggests. Thus, the Indian classical poetic theories are relevant in the sense that if we apply this theory is on the text, whether Indian text or Western text. It would be possible for us to look at the problem that we are facing today in a proper fashion. And in this way, we would be able to be helpful to humanity. So I end saying that Indian poetics, literary and critical traditions are not useless. They are meaningful and they are relevant. Only we need to relate them in such a manner that it makes an appeal to the young minds. The young minds require everything rational and you have to give at present what they want and then you can bring them to our terms and conditions. But initially we have to follow their terms and conditions and I wish that this August audience will certainly 
pay serious attention to this and see to it that in one way or the other indian poetics go into our curricula thank you thank you thank you so much sir for that composed uh, presentation in fact uh, i it, it was uh, i was reminded of uh, you know nostalgic memories 20 years back when i did my ma english because uh, and i was studying all these theories of course now there was a long lapse and a gap but uh, you have once again uh, brought live the indian classics especially the literary theories and the crux of your uh, presentation is yes if uh, theories are applied very well the output would be very positive very relevant and very meaningful so all scholars once again because most of them are also working on uh, literary theories so i request all the scholars i hope you have taken jotted down the points uh, the meaningful points that have really come up and the input that sir has given thank you so much sir thank you so much it was really a comprehensive and a very elaborate uh, presentation so thank you once again on behalf of uh, you yeah, because the sir uh, will be leaving us uh, we request our dear uh, uh, sir professor uh, uh, kamal mehta to accept little tokens of appreciation and also our felicitations uh, for uh, 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 being here with us uh, two days sir we please welcome you on to the days to accept our felicitation may i now uh, i have the uh, pleasure of inviting the head of the department of english dr k uh, vishnu divya associate professor ma'am please do come and uh, honor our uh, dear sir i i also take the privilege to invite professor struti sarkar ma'am to uh, do the uh, felicitation along with the head of the department of english dr k vishnu divya thank you sir for uh, accepting a little tokens of appreciation uh, we move on uh, to the next uh, uh, plenary speaker we have professor pradeepta sengupta associate professor muc women's college burdwan west bengal and uh, before uh, we invite our dear sir may i have uh, the pleasure of uh, calling upon dr jenny mary assistant professor department of english to introduce uh, our dear sir to the gathering dr pradeepta sengupta is an associate professor of english at muc women's college barwan west bengal he did his phd on
Dr. Pradinka Sengupta is an Associate Professor of English at MUC Women's College, Bardwan, West Bengal. He did his PhD on the Houtran novels of John Updike from the University of Bardwan. He also completed a postdoctoral research project on recasting contemporary America, a study of John Updike's rabbit tetralogy as a postdoctoral research fellow from Osmania University Center for International Program, Hyderabad, during September to October 2013. Apart from presenting papers at many national conferences, he has presented papers at Alvernia University, Pennsylvania in 2010 and 2014, Suffolk University, Boston in 2012, South California, sorry, South Carolina University in 2016, Belgrade University in 2018 and 2019, and at Tuscan, Arizona in 2023. He has also chaired session at the International Outrone and Po Conference in Kyoto, Japan in 2019. He has published national and international articles on Keats, Outrone, Steger, Dickens, Robert Frost, Peter Carey, Joseph Weller, W.E.S., Emerson and Uptight, including publications in such journals as the Belgrade Bells, University of Belgrade, the John Updike Review, University of Cincinnati, Nijansvo, and Lexington Book Series, New York. The name of Pranipta Sengupta figures in the International Updike Biograph Bibliography 2009 to 2015, prepared by the Updike critic James Cliff and published from the University of Cincinnati. So, with these few words, now I would like to invite Dr. Pradipta Sengupta, sir, to to uh, deliver your talk. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Respected chairperson, respected co speakers, teachers, scholars, faculty members, students, and everybody listening to this session. First of all, I would extend my thanks to Kelly University Guntu for giving me the chance for this wonderful session. And my special thanks are due to Dr. K.K. Sunalini and Dr. Anup Chatterjee, who happens to be my scholar and student. Please let me know if I'm audible to you. Am I audible to you? I, I, oh, okay, okay, oh, okay, okay. Then it's okay. So, uh, uh, switch off. Okay. So, a uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'd like to begin with a personal reference. I lost my father on November 21st, 2023, and until then, I had no idea as to what it means to be without a father. Although the title of my paper was selected before that, and although it was an unfortunate coincidence that someone having lost his father would be speaking on the absence of fathers in American fiction, my first yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, it's an unfortunate coincidence that the loss of my father coincides with the topic that I will be speaking on, but nevertheless, it helped me to present my paper and prepare my research not merely with my head, but with my heart. 
I would like to begin with three basic premises. I hope that the screen is visible to you, the slides on my PowerPoint presentation. The absence of fathers, my first premise, the absence of fathers in many American novels may be traced to the genesis of America, which was created by snapping off our parental European roots. My second premise, the aspect of single motherhood and single womanhood may be traced to American love for self-reliance and independence and to women's movement in America. And my last premise before I begin is some of the best American novels exhibit a conscious avoidance of domestic comfort and confine as also parental care, control and authority. On the contrary, such novels are withdrawn towards the lure of wilderness. With this brief premise, let me now begin my speech. Although America as a nation has had cradle in Europe, American history and American culture largely developed from her conscious separation from Europe. In her efforts to snap herself off her parental European roots, American forged a new distinct identity as an independent nation with a typical American dream of liberty, democracy, equality, and human rights. James Lawrence, in his studies in classic American literature, takes strong exception to reading old American classics merely as children's literature and insists to readers on finding out new voices embedded in them. Please come to my next slide. As Lawrence asked the basic question about an American artist at the very outset. He says that why isn't he a European still like his father before him? So this question of Lawrence, this particular question of Lawrence, <clears throat> the next slide, is it visible to you? I don't know. It betrays the basic fact about an American an American artist. Yeah. It it it, it betrays the basic fact about both an American and American artist that despite being born of European parents, an American is singularly free from his fatherly identity. And, and it is the conscious clapping of our European, yeah, yeah. Video can, can you see me? Video mode is there. Video mode, can't you see me? Okay. Video. So, how do I? So, can I stop my PPT now so that you can see me? Can you see me now? I can call. Okay, beside the mute, stop video. Video, yes, I have clicked that. On. Switch on video. Okay, okay. Video, I can see you, but switch on. Okay, let me let me try. Just a moment. So switch on. Now can you see me? Now am I busy? Not so just beside view there is video. Okay. I have clicked it, then camera, integrated cam, reference.
camera is on. Okay. 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 Let me let me stop the PPT. I think that then you can see me. Sharing this. Can you see me now? Can you see me? Not yet. Okay. 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 Let, let me stop the PPT. I think that PPT is creating some flows. Okay. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. In my device, oh, okay, 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 okay. Am I am I visible to you? Am I not here? Not yet. Not yet. Video. Chat. There is a mute option and then stop video option. Just. Now, now am I visible? Not yet. So, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, not share option. Video. Okay. Hello, sir. In the morning, you were visible to us, sir. The same process you can do, sir. There is an icon called as mic icon. Beside that, you will find the video icon. If you can just click yes. it, you will be able to see us and we will be able to see you, sir. I am clicking it, but the icon is giving stop video or video. I can okay. see myself in my screen. So you have to give it some time, sir. After switching it, you know, you, if you give some time, you know, it will start. Click the video mode and give one second time, sir. That oblique cross must disappear on the video icon. I, I'll take that pick and send it to sir, this one. Hmm. You can do it, sir. Uh, let me show you.
Can you see me now? We'll we'll let you know, sir. Just we are. Am I visible now? Sir, uh, please continue, sir, with the lecture. You are audible, very much audible. And uh, if you will be okay, able okay, to, sir. if you will be able to switch on uh, video, that would be fine. Otherwise, you can continue with the session, sir, as you are very much audible and clear to the audience. Thank you, sir. Okay, 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 okay. I'm uh, sorry for the inconvenience caused. I'm not comfortable with this system. Anyway, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Anyway, so D. H. Lawrence, he asked the basic question about an American artist at the very outset. Why isn't he a European still, like his father before him? This question betrays the basic fact about an American and American artist that, despite being born of European parents, an American is singularly free from his fatherly identity. And it is this conscious fluffing of her European parental mantle so as to assume an original new identity that forms the premise of the first part of my thesis that, broadly speaking, both American writers and novels in general tended to shake off the shackles and erase the hallmark of fatherly authority and influence. Does the absence of other figures in American literature in general? both literary as well as metaphorically seems to chime in with the American consciousness. But this is of course not to claim that father figures are absent in American literature. What I mean to pinpoint on the contrary is that the absence of father figures and the deliberate attempts to undermine the authority of father figures in American literature have been missed or overlooked by critics, scholars and readers alike. R. W. B. Lewy in The American Adam categorically insisted on the newness of the American experience, and I quote, the new habits to be engendered on the new American scene were suggested by the image of a radically new personality, the hero of the new adventure, an individual emancipated from history, happily bereft of an ancestry, untouched and defi undefiled by the usual inheritances of family and race, an individual standing alone, self-reliant and self propelling ready to confront whatever awaited him with the aid of his own unique and inherent resources." Unquote. His emphasis on self-reliance and independence also indirectly hints at the tendency to shed one's parental or ancestral authority and identity. If Liu had suggested that America since the age of Emerson has been persistently a one-generation culture, this generation is certainly that of the present, that of the son, and neither of the father nor of the future generation. Another historian, Carl Tegler, in his wonderful study out of the past, the forces that shaped America, takes a more realistic and rational stance and suggests, in the new world, the future was still fluid. Europe's ways, both the new and the old, could be planted in America free of the choking weeds of outmoded habits. America would be a testing ground, but it would be difficult to predict what would happen. Some of the European ways would wither, some would strike root, Still others would change and adapt to the new environment." Unquote. Despite this open-endedness of Degler's observation, what was consented by most of the critics was that America as a nation was ready to embrace new ideas and entertain new principles. In fact, John Crevetier, in one of his letters, in Letters from an American Farmer, had categorically insisted on this newness. I quote from letter number three 
He is an American who, leaving behind him all his ancient prejudices and manners, receives new ideas, new ones from the new mode of life he has embraced, the new government he obeys, and the new rank he holds. Unquote. I also wish to make it clear that although this insistence on newness does not necessarily suggest an absence of fatherly or ancestral values, it certainly does contain the seed of undermining the ancestral authority. Interestingly enough, a significant chunk of traditional early American novels and some best specimen of what we call quote unquote American novels, novels which bear the hallmark called American, for example, like Penny Moore Cooper's Leather, Talk, Leather Stocking Tale, Mark Twain's The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Tom's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Melville's Moby Dick, Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea, and The Sun Also Rises, Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage, Jack Kerouac's On the Road and Joseph Heller's Sketch 22, to mention only a few, do not focus on the poor American society. Rather than remain ensconced within the home, enjoying the warmth of domestic hurt or parental care, in many traditional early American novels, the protagonists are attracted towards the lure of the frontier or towards the wilderness of forests or privy or towards the adventurousness across the Mississippi on the raft with a fugitive slave or towards the wild and self destructive whale chase across the Atlantic or through the sea with an obsessive search for a big marlin fish or on the road on a wild peregrination across the continent or even to light out the territory. Just imagine a Captain Ahab lulled cozily in the care and cure of his parents or imagine a Santiago been ensconced with the comfort zone of domesticity, enjoying the television show with a warm cup of coffee, they would, cease, they would have ceased to become American heroes had they even dreamt of that. The avoidance of those domestic confines and parental authority and a deliberate plunge into the American wilderness seems central as it were to the American novel. The American writer argues Leslie Fidler in his famous Love and Death in the American novel, I quote, lives on the last horizon of an endlessly retreating vision of innocence on the frontier, which is to say the margin of the theory of original goodness and the fact of original scene come face to face, and quote. Fidler's comment attests to and confirms the lack of the solid societal domestic code in many early American writers. As Lionel Trilling so cogently claims, American writers of genius have not turned their minds to society. Richard Tays, in the American novel and its tradition, suggests that the quintessentially American masterpieces can be found in the romances which tend to divert themselves of the quotidian day-to-day -day social experiences. In this context, it is worth considering Chase's distinction between the novel and romance. I quote, the novel renders reality closely and in comprehensive detail. By contrast, the romance, following this family, the medieval example, seems free to render reality in less volume and detail. It tends to prefer action to character, and the action will be freer in a romance than in a novel, encountering, as it were, less resistance from reality. Despite all these observations, it is also true that there is a huge chunk of American no novels soaked in social realistic depiction. For example, writers like Henry James, Sinclair Lewy, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Theodore Drazer, Ted Shopping, John of Dye, Joyce, Joyce Carol Oates, among others, were very much rooted to their social sphere and wrote from the center of their society rather than from the outskirts of the frontier. I come to the second part of my discussion, 
the novel which exemplifies both the absence of father and the struggle of a single mother in a dominant way is of course Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Hester Prince's estrangement from her old and old husband Roger Chillingworth and her choice to leave her ancestral England to come to New England, Massachusetts Bay Colony give us the first inkling of an independent and single woman ready to wrestle her life. Later, her adulterous union with a pastor at the Dinsdale precipitates the birth of her illicit daughter, Pearl, who remains both literally and virtually fatherless throughout the novel. What is singularly significant about Pearl is that she delightfully acquiesces in her fatherlessness. When in Chapter 8, Governor Bellingham wants to take custody of Pearl from her adulterous mother so as to educate her in a better way, and when Mr. Wilson asks Pearl about her identity, Pearl gives a brilliant reply. I want to quote that reply. I am mother's child, answered the scarlet vision, and my name is Pearl at all. This reply is at once her attempts to forge out her identity in terms of her mother rather than her father, and also a deliberate dismantling and rejection of her father in her life. Still earlier, in chapter 6, Hester's prayer to God. I quote a portion of that prayer, O Father in heaven, if thou art still my father, what is this being which I have brought into this world? This prayer subverts and eliminates the existence of an earthly father on the one hand and also interrogates, interrogates the role of the heavenly father, father. In the same chapter, Hester, in a rather mischievous and frivolous mood, asks, Well, tell me then, what art thou, and who sent thee hither? Honorable Chancellor, the intelligible, intelligent and mischievous Pearl shifts the question back to her mother, who replies, Thy heavenly father sent thee. Hester's reply is both the rejection of an earthly and social father and also offers a better alternative to such an earthly father and by so doing, flagrantly flouts the patriarchal structure of a society. Still later, in one of the forest scenes, in chapter 19, Arthur Dinsdale, in a frantic effort to reclaim his fatherhood, implants the kiss on little Pearl's forehead. She goes to the brook and washes her forehead repeatedly to wash off the stain of that unwelcome kiss. Thus, if in Pearl's life, the absence of an earthly father is conditioned by a series of circumstances, it is approved of, as it were, by the choice of both the mother and the daughter. In other words, both Hester and Pearl, as it were, accept and rejoice in Pearl's fatherlessness and Hester's status as a single mother. Uh, to do justice to other novels, let me just speed over this novel and come to another novel. John Updike's S. S was published in 1988 and it is the third installment of what we know as the Carlin Letter Trilogy. John Updike, the contemporary American novelist, he wrote three novels, three intertexts on the Scarlet Letter, A Month of Sundays, published in 1975, Rogers' version in 1986, and S, just the alphabetical letter S, in 1988. In this novel, we find the tale of Sarah Watt, the Updikean equivalent of Hester Preen, Sarah has chosen a course of single mother, though not by an official divorce from her adulterous husband, Charles, who happens to be a doctor. Couched in, a, couched in an epistolary form, the novel dishes out a series of letters, mainly from Sarah to different people, in one of her letters written to Charles, Sarah culminates, and I quote, I shed you as I would shed a skin. The affront to your pride and convenience of my desertion should weigh little in any wise court against 
than nearly 22 years of mental and emotional cruelty with you with your antiseptic chill have inflicted on me." Unquote. In the same letter, Sarah reveals that adulterous Niazos with, an, with another person in an unabashed boldness. To find spiritual solace and a true significance of life, life Sarah joins the Hindu ashram in Arizona desert. Actually, this ashram is modeled on Rajnish Puram. And this novel was based on the scandals which were published on the controversial Guru Osho. In a moving, painful letter, Sarah reminds Paul of a maternal role and betrays the suppressed peak bickerings of Paul's fondness towards the father. You write of what a, I quote, you write of what a tender and attentive father yours was when the sad truth is. He hardly bothered to kiss you good goodnight most nights, let alone read a bedtime story, as you and he both seem to be fantasizing. Precious Paul, make no mistake. I nursed you. I changed your diapers. I dried your tears. I sang you your songs. Like this, she goes on. And like his supreme, who had deserted her ancestral Europe to peregrinate to the wilderness of New England, Sarah has abandoned her domestic moorings in New England to prominent in the deserts of Arizona. Hester is home to wandering wildly among the Indians without rule or guidance in a moral wilderness. And her intellect and heart had her home, as it were, in the desert places where she roamed as freely as the wild Indian in, in the woods, Sarah too rambles widely in the desert of Arizona for spiritual fulfillment and individual freedom. But as we go through the novel, we find that Sarah's alibi for joining the ashram and spiritual salvation, it becomes an alibi for material exercise. Even the description of the ashram reveals it to be a place for pleasure and material luxury than a place for spiritual asceticism. For example, Sarah writes how she always thought deserts were supposed to be dead, but this one is just hoping with life, especially after the sun goes down. And taking into this gadget, the sake of many cassette player I bought at this electronic boutique, actually in this ashram you find shopping malls, swimming pools, disco club, everything is there. All kinds of voluptuousness is there. So that's why. And Sarah is very much surprised. So the novel ultimately fails to assure spiritual salvation to Sarah. But ultimately, it turns out to be the struggle of a single and independent mother. In Abda, it's another novel, Roger's version. It is the second installment of the Scarlet Letters in the textual version. The daughter of Roger's half sister Edna Eklop, her name is Varna, she stays with the mother Paula. Paula is the equivalent for Pearl here in a cheap, shabby apartment. If Pearl was accidentally conceived by Hester, in that she was the product of Hester's adultery. And she was Hester's living scarlet letter. Paula's birth was also accidental. She was the child of Varna by a black man who had deserted her. Both are products of momentary instinctual impulse and are not conceived in a pre planned way. Thus, both Pearl and Paula have been deserted by their respective fathers, and both their mothers happen to be single mothers. Father, like her kindred pearl, Paula develops an antagonistic feeling towards her father and every father figure whom she refers to dear da. da. She is a little child and cannot say daddy, so she just utters da. Like Hawthorne's Paul, Paula has an intuitive faculty of detecting the truth. In a dignified manner, manner Paula suddenly blurts out da. Bad, that this father is bad. 
This reminds one of Paul's lofty smile of birth and intelligence at Mr. Dean's girl. This aversion of the father figure intertextually places Paul in the same paradigm as Pearl who relegates her father to insignificance. How much time do I have? How much time am I permitted? When am I supposed to stop? Please let me know five minutes before that. We come to another novel. Theodore Grace, the sister Carrie, charts the career of Carrie Niebuhr from a humble origin to a famous actress to a series of adversities and failed relationships. 18 years old, pretty Carrie lives and how, how, when am I supposed to stop? Sir, we will give you a reminder. Do not worry, sir. Please carry on. Okay, okay. Uh, you okay, will okay. have. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. 19 years old, pretty Carrie lives in native Wisconsin and comes to Chicago to stay with her elder sister Minnie and her husband Hanson to make her fortune there. In the train in which she boats, she meets the smart and snappy traveling salesman Charlie Drift, who feels attracted towards her and creates a positive impact on her. Carrie finds it quite difficult to live in the congested apartment of her sister in Chicago, particularly because of the indifferent and cold attitude of her husband's, of her sister's husband, Hanson. Although Carrie finds a job at, 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 at a shoe factory, the salary that is just $4.5 per week was too meager an amount to cater to her basic necessities. Furthermore, the unsympathetic behavior of her fellow workers also make her uncomfortable. Carrie finds it both inconvenient and humiliating to stay in the apartment of her sister who expect her to pay for the food she eats there, unable to sustain the drudgery and uncongenial ambience of the shoe factory. She quits the job. The problem is aggravated when Minnie and Hanson express their reluctance to support her father. Carrie chooses to stay as the mistress of Charlie Dwight, whom she had met in the train, and who, in spite of his infatuation with her, is never serious about marrying her. This frivolity of Dwight leads Carrie to shift her attention to Mr. George Hartsuit, the manager of a saloon in Chicago, and one who announces his love for her, but suppresses that he is already a married man and married to a lady called Julia. Her suit elopes with Carrie to Montreal after stealing $10,000 from the saloon. Although her suit marries Carrie secretly without divorcing Julia and concealing the theft from Carrie, the series of incidents reveal the secrets and ultimately, Julia comes to know about that and she files a case for di divorce against him. Disillusioned with her spook's shadowy and fishy ways of life, Carrie leaves him and begins her single independent life, first as a singer and then as an actress. The fact that her set had two children with Julia consigns Julia to the status of a single mother although she does not confront the adults and struggles of a single mother truly. On the other hand, Carrie, although not a single mother, is certainly a single woman who wrestles against the adversities of a life almost single-handedly and shines in fame in splendid isolation. Although Dreza's sister Carrie is not exactly the story of the single mother but that of a single woman, his novel Jenny Gerhardt, dwells on a single mother by the name of the same character, Jenny Gerhardt, the beautiful protagonist from a simple hum and humble origin. While working as a child woman with a mother at a high-class hotel in Columbus, Ohio, Senator George Brandes gets attracted towards her and desires to marry her. George helps their family and gets closer to Jenny. Jenny gets impregnated by George, but before they could marry, he unfortunately dies of typhoid fever. Jenny gives birth to her daughter, Presta, and assumes the role of a single mother 
by circumstances rather than by choice. She tries to bring Vesta up with the help of her mother in Cleveland. While working as a page to a lady, Jenny falls in love with a man called Lester Kane, the affluent son of a prosperous manufacturer. Yeah. Mm. Okay, 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 okay. I, I'll wind it up. Thank, thank you, so much. So, initially I had a desire to talk about three more novels, but time won't permit me to do so. So what I am trying to do is that examples can only ratify my view. While more examples could be adduced, it can be argued indisputably that American literature bristles with plenty of examples of absent fathers and single mothers. In Mark Twain's Adventures of Tom Sawyer and its sequel, The uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, the largely missing fatherhood becomes subservient to the predominant role of friendship. In Henry James's Watch and Word, Nora Lambert is brought up not by her biological father, but adopted by her future husband. While the orphan siblings, Miles and Flora, in James's The Town of the School, are looked after by a governess. Fitzgerald Gatsby in The Great Gatsby consciously sheds his parental identity and his ancestral name Gaz and assumes the name Gatsby. So in this way there are plenty of examples, but one thing I want to add, this is very interesting and perhaps something new, in the context of single motherhood, which is an extension of single women, I have an interesting point to offer. A new trait in American fiction may be found in contemporary American novels, that of female bonding. If we go back to the early American novels, we are very much familiar with, we may find a host of male bonding rather than female bonding. For example, Huck and Tom, Huck and Jim in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Ishmael and Cricket in Melvin's Morbidi, Natty Bumpo and Shingart's book in Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans, Santiago and Manolin and Henry Hemingway's The Old Son of the Sea, Nick Carway and Jay Gatsby in Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, and so on. But in recent American novels, you'll find a female body. Just in Abdike's The Witches of East, we find a bonding among three women the sculptor Alexander, the columnist Suki, and the musician Jane. In Tony Morrison's Sula, we find the deep bonding between Sula and her friend Nell. While in Alice Walker's The Color Purple, a temporary bonding develops between Silly and Shad Avery. In Gloria Naylor's The Women of Brister Place, we find how the black women living in the same housing project are capable of female bonding. This wonderful phenomenon of female bonding is at once an attempt to subvert and dismantle women's dependence on men and a mark of self-reliance and self-sufficiency achieved by women in recent years. Now, to conclude very briefly, what may be the possible reasons? It needs deep research. There are some sociological research carried out in this context. Some research have been carried out. I could not get time to some of those research, but there are some factors which have led to such conditions. For example, to sum up, some of the factors which have led to this fatherlessness and to the condition of single women in American literature. Number one, genesis of America and sense of self-reliance, conflict and lack of social adjustment in domestic society. Lots of research have been carried out in this regard. I could not sum up those research, unfortunately. Then growing numbers of divorces, sexual revolution of 1960s, drug explosion, sex explosion, materialistic affluence. More importantly, women's movement rights and security, and last but not certainly the least, the lesbian trends in modern literature 
and uh, trend of female bonding. So that is all I had to offer. Uh, very briefly, though not exhaustively, let me conclude by saying that this research is not a comprehensive research, but it throws subtle light on those untapped areas which can be explored later on by future researchers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for that very extensive uh, presentation. Sir, you have said, uh, you have spoken about the concept of single motherhood in uh, American literature and also the absence of father and uh, how it is projected in American fiction. Yes, sir, we do agree that uh, women are empowered and they are self-sufficient, they are self-made and they can uh, lead a very peaceful and successful life, though with all the struggles. And sir, most of our scholars are also working on American and Afro-American literature. And uh, it is, uh, I right. think your presentation should be really very useful so that they can incorporate them in their uh, research. And uh, we are very happy about it, sir. It was quite an interesting uh, presentation. Thank you so much. With all these uh, obstacles that we had, technical issues, still you were able to make it, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you once again, sir. And uh, my dear uh, colleagues, yes, sir. So we break for lunch, just half an hour's time we have. And please uh, be back at 2 o'clock. And uh, parallel, we also have parallel presentations, online and offline both. And while we also have simultaneously an online session by Professor Derek Irwin. So once we get back from lunch, we will continue with the plenary speech of Professor Derek Irwin, which will be through virtual platform. Thank you all. We break for lunch now. Thank you.
an example from Canadian children's literature. Sir, we are very happy to have you this uh, afternoon here, of course, in uh, India. And uh, we hope that our scholars and faculty will be enlightened with your speech. Now, before I invite you formally, sir, I call upon my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, A. Pavani, Assistant Professor and uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Major of uh, uh, the college to introduce uh, Dr. Derek Irwin to the August gathering. A very good, good afternoon to the August gathering and uh, Professor Dr. Derek Irwin. Good afternoon. Hope everything is fine. Everything is excellent. Thank you very much. Very nice to see you here, sir. Uh, Dr. Derek Irwin is the chair of the International Systematic Functional Linguistics Association and honorary president of the International Halidian Association. He is an associate professor of applied linguistics at the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China, and a visiting professor at Sun Yat-sen University. His works deal with lexical movement across languages, agnation patterns in writing, student writing more broadly, and technological interventions in teaching. He is the reviews editor for the SFL Journal Language Context and Text, the Social Semiotic Form Forum, and supervises doctoral students across a range of subjects in applied linguistics and pedagogy. He is also a director, actor, and writer whenever he finds space time. And really, the audience, we are very fortunate to have a writer a director and actor amongst us. And really, Dr. Derek Irwin, it's a very fortunate uh, session to us to have your session in this international conference. A warm welcome and over to you, Professor Derek Irwin. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, confirm how long I should speak? Fifteen minutes. Five zero. Thank you very, very much. Uh, very kind of you, and uh, what a lovely introduction. I, I think many of you might know that uh, I, I managed to make it to Gunther uh, in 2020. I am very sorry that I'm not there myself to join you. Uh, it's a lovely place to visit, a uh, wonderful host. And I have to say, I, I miss the food very much. We get some okay Indian food here in uh, Ningbo, China, but nowhere near as good as yours. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, systemic functional linguistics and how we can use uh, SFL tools to do a kind of stylistic analysis. And I'm going to, to use one of my favorite stories, uh, which is a Canadian children's story. And hopefully uh, it'll be fun to look at this and also think about the types of tools that we can, we can use out of SFL. So can you see my slides okay? Are the slides all fine? Excellent. Okay. So um, I'm not sure how familiar people might be with SFL. So I'm going to just give some basic uh, functional linguistics theories and tools. So I'll, I'll enter into that. I'll talk about the specific book that I'm going to be uh, examining, that I'll be analyzing, which is a book called The Paper Bag Princess. And it's by a writer named Robert Munch, who is a Canadian children's writer, uh, originally done in 1980. There's been a lot of different editions. I'm going to present the analysis using uh, the tools of theme, mood, transitivity, and ultimately the idea of genre. And then I'll try to reach some conclusions, although uh, I can't guarantee I'm correct, and you're welcome to challenge me or ask any questions that you'd like. So uh, some of you will probably be 
this. This is a basic uh, model within systemic function linguistics where we have different levels of so any given uh, example of a language will have a context, uh, it will have some form of content, uh, typically uh, lexico-grammatical, so word choices, grammar choices, uh, and then some form of semantics. And then there's a production plane. So right now I'm speaking, I'm using uh, phonemes to put together all of these things. And within the content plane, there are three metafunctions that organize the, the meaning. So there's a textual metafunction, there's an interpersonal metafunction, and there's an experiential metafunction. And each of these have different grammatical systems that we can analyze a text using. So I'll, I'll go through these uh, with this particular text. This all fits in with the overall holistic theory of language. So in the functional grammar approach, we do try to uh, deal with the overall idea of cultural context. Um, and a situational context. So in this particular context uh, that I'm speaking in now, uh, we don't completely share a culture, although we do have an overall academic culture that we're part of. Uh, and the situation is a plenary talk, and of course it has a different modality. So I'm doing this online, so it's not exactly what you would uh, think of as a, a plenary talk. And those of you that uh, I might have interacted with the last time I'm there know that usually when I talk, I like to walk around the room, try to make it very nice. I can't walk around because I feel like the camera. Um, every time that we're dealing with the context, of course, cultures have what we might call ideology. So there are ways and patterns of meaning that take place within a given culture. But I'm also going to be dealing with the idea of genre. So uh, any given text uh, is an example of like texts, so texts which are like it, that we could call a genre. Um, and within any given type of genre, there's also selections in what we could call a, a field, a tenor, and a mode. It's constantly a register. Uh, again, that content means the semantics and lexical grammar, and at the production level, we have phonology or in a written text, uh, graphology. So, uh, this model is, is very common to, to talk about language in SML, although there are different variations. Um, the, the element that I do want to just talk about here and point out is that uh, there is a theory of genre that I so um, there's lots of different theories of genre. Uh, from a literary perspective, of course, we're going to be talking about two types of genre, within a kind of children's literature. But overall, from a language point of view, I'd like you to think of genre in terms of a, a bell curve. So a, a genre is basically uh, what we understand of as being normal. So if we're going into a shop, we're having a sales encounter, and we want to exchange money for some form of goods. And so we have a, a particular way that we go about this. Um, genres are normalized patterns. So they're not actual, they're not specific text. And so they're more like if you're squinting at a lot of different they're, they're what we might call climate and not weather. They're not instances, but they're patterns of many instances. What's interesting to us, I hope, as linguists, but also even as teachers, is that when we're dealing with genre, we have a certain expectation of what's normal. And if we get some form of text which is not what we would consider normal, we have a choice then. We can either consider it to be improper, and we can say, oh, there's, there's a real problem with this text. So if you are in a sales encounter and you are going into a store and you're supposed to be exchanging 
money for goods, but somehow you don't give them the money, then you're no longer successfully in a sales encounter. You're stealing things. So you create a big problem that way. Uh, or we can have at the extreme end someone who is using a genre very differently and it indicates some form of master. So I'm sure all of you as, as teachers have gotten an essay, for example. And you look at the, an essay which doesn't quite fit into what you expect. And either it could fit into what you expect and you would say, oh, this is bad. Or it can fit into what you, doesn't quite fit into what you expect and you think, this is amazing. So the normality of the genre is in the center. It's exactly what you expect. If it goes outside of that, there are risks. Now, the reason I bring this up is because uh, this book, The Paperback Princess, is changing the genre. At least I, I argue it's changing the genre. It's a children's book, and it's gotten a lot of different attention. Most of the attention uh, on this particular book has been gender perspectives. Uh, Dean in 2000 did talk about it in terms of mixing genres, but it wasn't uh, from the perspective of analyzing the text. It was from the perspective of teaching or responding to the text. But a lot has been done with this book on gender. So all the way, the, the first kind of major study that was the paperback princess for gender was in 1989. Davies did this particular article, uh, The Discursive Production of Male-Female Dualism in School Settings. But that was then picked up again in like, the by Evans. And, and you can see that there's been many, many studies where this book is, is talked about in terms of gender. Uh, it's also been looked at in all of these cases to a certain extent about how it fits in with early childhood education. And uh, English is foreign language teaching more generally. So I, I encourage people to read this book because it's also a lot. Ultimately, though, from a stylistic perspective, we ask ourselves, how does the text do it? So what makes this text special? And it's not just simply about the gender. So what I have said is a core argument is that when the paperback princess was attempting to subvert the gender roles, instead of just being able to flip the gender roles, uh, it shifts the genre. So instead of being a fairy tale, uh, which it still is in the sense of Lexus, you can tell by the title, it's got a princess, or it's the paperback princess, there's a castle, there's a prince, there's a dragon. But it could no longer be purely a fairy tale. So uh, this actually has shifted in terms of its genre. So the, the fundamental generic structure of this narrative has to be bent to a different purpose. Okay. So this is what uh, Robert Munch actually says. About it. Uh, so on his website, he's explaining how this came. So he was working in the United States, in Oregon, in a child care center. And he was actually working with his wife at this child care center. And one of the things he had to do, like we all do with kids, is telling them stories. So Robert Munch had been making up all of these dragon stories. And he said they were all fairly regular dragon stories where the prince saves the princess from the dragon. And I'm sure you can think to yourself, okay, if I'm telling a fairy tale, how does this go? So first of all, you would have a prince, and then you have a beautiful princess, and something's likely they're going to get. And then along comes a dragon, steals away the princess. The prince has to go out, and typically the prince would have to fight the dragon, so the prince would have a sword. Or something. Now, Munch said the reason he did this gender version is that his wife came to him and said, well, why do you always have the prince save the princess? Why can't the princess save the prince? And Munch thought about that and changed around the ending of one of these dragon stories. 
So the adults suddenly seemed a lot happier. The kids didn't seem to buy them. And this is kind of the important thing. So when the paperback princess was published in 1980, it sold 3,000 copies, which was pretty great. But since then, it's actually sold over 3,000 copies. So uh, on a personal note, I can tell you that when my daughter was born in Canada, one of our friends came over with a copy of the paperback princess and gave it to our family and said, here you go. This is you, you have a little girl. She should be reading this story. So it was one of the first stories that we read to our daughter. Still, probably it's one of her favorites. Uh, she's much older now. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the book or read it because I, I'm told that this is going to be recorded and put on YouTube. Uh, I don't want to get into trouble with copyright violations or that thing. Um, but what I'm going to be doing from here on out is taking a really close look to the grammatical and discourse patterns of it. And I'm going to explain why I think uh, flipping the gender of this protagonist actually then fundamentally changes the type of book that it is, at least in terms of its shock. So th these are actually the first two parts. Starts with Elizabeth was a beautiful princess. She lived in a castle and had expensive princess clothes. She was going to marry a prince named Robert. And out of this, then, we get the action. So the dragon attacks them, destroys everything around, blows his fiery breath, destroys the castle, and he carries off the prince. Uh, Elizabeth has all of her clothes burned off, everything is destroyed, and the only thing she can find. Is a paper bag that she wants to wear. She then decides she's going to go and rescue Ronald. So she goes after the dragon, bangs on his door, and he answers, but then first of all slams the door. So obviously already there's something. So she tries again, bangs on the door, and the dragon answers again. And she flatters the dragon into showing us that he can burn up forests with his breath. So he burns up 10 forests and 20 forests, and then he's out of fire, so he's no longer able to uh, burn up anything. She then basically says, oh, you're so big and strong, I've heard you can fly around the world in just 20 seconds. And so he does so, he flies around the world twice, and then by the time he gets back, he's so tired, it's going to scream so, uh, Elizabeth goes in to rescue Ronald. Now, at this point in you know, traditional fairy tale, of course, they live happily ever after, right? But Ronald actually says to him, he says to Elizabeth, oh, you're such a mess. Uh, please go get cleaned up and come back and address like the real says. And this is actually a quote from Elizabeth. So she says, Ronald, said Elizabeth, your clothes are really pretty, and your hair is very neat. You look like a real prince, but you are a mom. And of course, this is a very funny line for children. So the kids start laughing at this. And the final line of this book is, they didn't get married after all. So unlike a traditional fairy tale, where the last line should be, they lived happily ever after, this one, they didn't get married after all. Okay? So, I'm not going to deal with the pictures of the book, although it's a picture book, and you can see here there's a really kind of cool picture. This is when the dragon is answering the door. This is the paperback princess here. Um, Michael Marchenko is an award-winning uh, illustrator. He's worked with Robert Munch with many books. Uh, and I, I've actually done a thorough analysis of multimodal elements in this, but I'm not going to discuss that today. I'm going to deal with the language, uh, and so the, the written stylist is about this, which makes it a unique book. So what is it about this? That's, that's quite good. Um, okay, so uh, based on Davy's study, uh, we have a rather extensive quote here. But basically what's interesting to us, I'm not sure what your reaction is to the idea of the, the princess rescuing the prince. Uh, but this does go to show us how stereotyped 
all of the thinking can be, even when uh, very young begins. So very often the reaction to paper bag princess and children is that there is a problem. They will say they don't like Elizabeth. Elizabeth is bad, uh, and she shouldn't be calling Ronald the Uh Adults love it, so most adults will applaud this and say it's an absolutely fantastic ending to the book. But children are already uh, socialized in certain ways of viewing gender. And uh, as the last line of this here says, in terms of adolescent girls reading, uh, even strong non-traditional female characters do not necessarily socialize children into non-traditional roles. And so this is a problem with children's books, is that you know, we're just counting the number of female characters, that can be problematic. So again, this book sold over three million copies. Uh, quite a number of people have looked at what it does in terms of gender, but almost no one on how it does it in terms of the language. Uh, it's a recommendation text, so it's, it's considered a, a feminist text by the National Organization of Women on their Amazon store. So it, it should be reflecting a female positive ideology. Um, but the interesting question is why do children resist this talent? So I'm going to use functional linguistics and genre theory and talk about how gender and genre are being used here to make this text do something very so that the author is considered a master of reading children's literature by what he does with this particular story. So I'm going to give this textual analysis. I'm going to look at the clause complexes. So this is kind of technical work. Uh, the theme and the macro theme. We're going to go through the system of mood and the discourse semantics. I'm going to talk about the transitivity system as it exists in this book, and then I'm going to finish with talking about how this affects the genre and how this uh, genre can be seen as being bent. Okay. So if you're doing a full analysis of this, which I do, uh, you can say that the text has 99 ranking clauses. Out of these, uh, there are eight simplexes, so eight single clause sentences. Uh, 31 of the clauses uh, within the clause complex are related uh, in terms of hypotaxis. So this is a dependency relationship. Uh, but more than that, 60 of them are parataxis. So parataxis is when they're on the same level, so they're two independent clauses together. Uh, and thought or using a quote different So th this isn't hugely surprising. It's a children's book. It's a children's text. The kinds of logical relations that we see are very close to spoken language. Uh, most of the hypotaxis is also very simple. So it's saying things like X was so Y that Z. So this is a very simple kind of uh, a dependency. Um, but the text, because it's a narrative text, and because it deals with a lot of spoken language, it's about projection. So a lot of things are being said. And who it's being said by becomes very important. So who are the participants that are the ones involved in this? So in terms of sentence level, uh, most of the time, themes deal with subjects, and so these are, are participants. But in this text, what is very interesting is the pattern of the participants. So as you go through and think about who is the focus of any given sentence, uh, this is the pattern. So you can see uh, Elizabeth is the protagonist, is the one at the start, and then there's a dragon. And Elizabeth, dragon, Elizabeth, dragon. So actually, uh, Ronald doesn't exist in this text thematically until the very end. Uh, the whole text is about exchanges between Elizabeth and this dragon. Um, Prince Ronald appears at the end, 
and then Prince Ronald is combined with uh, Princess Elizabeth, but not fully successful, as we see. We can talk about uh, Jim Martin's theory of macro. So theme is at a sentence level. Uh, it's dealing with whatever is at the beginning of a clause. Macro theme is how we can understand a uh, textual level idea of a theme. So what is the overarching topic? So here, uh, the macro theme essentially is the sentence that drives most of this text, which is uh, Elizabeth decided to chase the dragon and get all of that. So the ream of this blog, the theme of this projected blog, is to chase and to get it back. And that's basically what happens with the whole text. But you can see that there's a kind of book ended theme, a macro theme, which comes from the ream of uh, to marry a prince named Ronald. And then, of course, there's the final line that didn't get married after all. So there is a very nice uh, symmetry to this particular text where we have this idea of getting married, this idea of chasing the dragon, getting Ronald back, and that drives all of the action. But then at the very end, the inversion of this where they don't get married after all. Grammatical mood uh, has to do with the positions of the subject and the finite. So the vast, vast majority of the clauses in this particular text are declarative. So declarative is subject followed by finite. Um, but we do have these following exceptions. So the dragon says, three imperative clauses. And the dragon gives these three uh, imperatives, which are non-subject, non-functional. Uh, come back tomorrow, go away, come back tomorrow. Uh, Elizabeth uses one imperative, wait, and she uses two interrogatives. Is it true? Is it true? And then she uses another imperative, do it again. Uh, and then, of course, Ronald has his uh, comeback, which is, sorry, which is his imperative. Now, these give us a bit of a clue because mood is grammatical, but we also have the semantic value. So in terms of discourse semantics, there's preferred and dispreferred responses. So we can analyze a text by looking at the characters and say, okay, um, when you have imperatives, normally something like come back tomorrow, go away, come back tomorrow, would be considered commands. The dragon is telling you what to do. So command or in this case, service to go away. Uh, interestingly, in these cases, Elizabeth obviously doesn't comply. So the dragon says, basically, come back tomorrow, go away, come back tomorrow, give him his commands, and Elizabeth just doesn't. She doesn't say no, but she also doesn't do it, so she doesn't comply with it. And those of you who are parents, you know, children don't comply with very frustrating. Uh, but in this case, she doesn't have to. But she is giving her own commands. She says, wait. And when Elizabeth commands, the dragon does wait. So the dragon complies. Now, Elizabeth asks these two uh, interrogatives. Is it true? Is it true? And the dragon does answer both. The dragon says, why, yes. Yes, it's true. So if these are questions, then the dragon has answered them, and that's the preferred response. But if we can see these also as commands, because Elizabeth is trying to get him to do something, she's trying to get him to fly around the world, she could be commanding him, and he also does comply. He does do it. So Elizabeth gives a command that he's complied with, questions and is answered, and she then says, do it again, and he does. 
And when Ronald actually gives a command, which is come back again when you're dressed in the princess, he uses his, his imperative mood, tries to give a command, and Elizabeth doesn't comply. She does not come back tomorrow, and instead she rejects it. So the point here is that in terms of the discourse, in terms of tenor, in terms of the relationships within the institution, the dragon has a physical power. The dragon is able to destroy castles and steal friends. But when it comes to discourse power, he doesn't have to command Elizabeth, but she does not comply. Elizabeth, on the other hand, has physical power. But she's the only one in the story that has discourse as well. So she isn't able to physically affect him, but she uses her words and she has complete power over the other participants. Uh, Ronald, on the other hand, has no discourse at all. And in the end of the story, he loses even what little power he had over the other At the beginning of the story, uh, she was in love with him, but by the end of the story, she realizes he's above. Uh, hopefully, you're at least a little bit familiar with what we look at in terms of the experiential type. So, in, in functional linguistics, there are six process types in terms of the experiential. We can talk about uh, material causes, which are causes of doing. So if you kick, if you walk, if you swim, these are material causes that are involved in the physical world. Relational causes are either giving a tribute to something. So if you say, uh, she was pretty, that's an attributive clause. Uh, or they're identifiers. So uh, her name is Elizabeth, and that is giving you an identification. Uh, mental clauses are verbs of either emotion, thinking, uh, verbal clauses are uh, speaking. Uh, behavioral clauses are psychological processes. And existential is just the existence of something. So uh, Christian Mathis sent in 1999, wrote a paper called The System of Transitivity, and he looked at a generalized corpus. He said, across a general corpus written in spoken English, about half of the clauses you find are going to be material, about a quarter of them are going to be relational, 10% mental, almost 10% verbal, will be some behavioral clauses, and, and less significant even the existential clauses. And if you look at the, the paperback princess, we can analyze all these clauses. It's not really surprising. Uh, material clauses may have a bit more than you would expect, but you know, we're dealing with a narrative, so a narrative is about doing uh, relational clauses. About. There are fewer mental than we would expect. There are more verbal than we would expect. Uh, and both the behavior is existential around that. But the problem is, um, when we're dealing with a narrative, so stylistic, we're not dealing with an entire set of clauses. So just doing a, a transitivity analysis like this, doesn't tell us as much as we might look like. So, um, we can look at text-level patterns. So when we talk about uh, genre, we're talking about choices over time. As well. So genre is staged, uh, famously, Jim Martin described the genre as a staged, goal-oriented text that takes place in culture. So I was thinking about this in terms of the analysis. I can say, okay, there's a flow of processes inside the text. We have to be able to recognize the genre somewhere. Uh, and when you're using especially narrative writing, you have a choice of participants. So there's someone who is doing it. Uh, so we can look at the whole text in terms of each of the causes. And these uh, are color material processes. The, uh, uh, sorry, the, the uh, pink are relational processes. Uh, then you have uh, mental processes in orange, or purple processes in dark blue. Um, so these are 
the way that the text flows in processes. And as you can see, there's a kind of periodicity here. There's clusters of doing, and there's clusters of description nation. And there's one example of existential process. Um, so this is one way to do it, this is the text as a whole. This is okay when we're dealing with smaller text because you can put the whole text out. Um, but then I thought, okay, what if we looked at it this way? One of the things that this is missing is the notion of projection. So here, uh, what I've done is I've just quoted the processes in terms of, if, if the same type of process is repeated, it becomes a bigger arrow. Uh, and if something is happening inside of a verbal process, it's put in this kind of projected bubble. Uh, so this is how the text would look like. It's looking at the periodicity of these processes. And then we can code this again. So we can say, uh, okay, Elizabeth, what is she more involved? Elizabeth is more involved in relational processes. She's the one who's doing most of the projecting. The dragon is more involved in the doing processes, although he does have some projection. Uh, and Ronald is involved in the only existential process that, that is in this story. We can also directly relate this to John. So we can analyze this text in terms of these generic stages. So a narrative has what's called an orientation, which in this case is mostly relational processes. It is a complication, which in this case is a blend of uh, the material process and, in this case, a mental process. Complications and resolutions have to do with what happens and then they're, how they're resolved. So you can see the initial complication resolution here is actually done in the material and application processes. But as it goes through, the complications are both material and then they're resolved in the verbal. So this text is largely about Elizabeth solving material problems with verbal processes. Now, in terms of the text internal tenor, we can talk about these relationships that Elizabeth is first relating to Ronald in relational and mental desiderative ways. So she is describing the world, describing Ronald, and then talk about the love for it. When the antagonist takes him away, it's materially affected um, as a traditional theory to email would be the goal, right? the dragon will steal the girl. So we expect that a female to be affected. He's affected instead. She takes on the role of the typical protagonist, except that in a fairy tale, we would expect the protagonist to have armor and a sword and other things to materially affect the antagonist. She's instead given a paper back. So she has absolutely zero material uh, affect at her disposal. However, in keeping with what we might think of as a gender stereotype, uh, Elizabeth is actually too weak to materially affect this male gender type. So instead of doing, instead of material processes, she moves to verbal ones and affects him only with language. So ultimately, the, swift, the switch in the gender demands a fundamental shift in genre. So instead of the fairy tale just being flipped of the female protagonist fighting the antagonist, we have a narrative that's more suited to what's a physically weak protagonist. So in North American genes, uh, uh, this is a well-known uh, trickster. Uh, here in China, we have a version the Monkey King, although the Monkey King is still physically powerful, 
but uh, this is represented in popular culture by characters like Bugs Bunny or Jimmy. So you, the trickster has to do something that isn't physically violent to solve problems. So the shift in gender roles also creates a weakness in the supposed ending of they lived happily ever after. So Ronald's character actually brings in negative evaluation of Elizabeth, and she rejects this with her own superior evaluation of him. So this is where the relation of the obsessives come in. So ultimately, and this is where I'll conclude this, and hopefully there might be a few questions. Uh, playing with genre carries a risk. So if you were to do this, again, many children reject this story and say that uh, they don't like the way that Elizabeth rejects uh, Ronald at the end. Uh, they don't think she is good or a good girl in what she's doing. Uh, but adults absolutely love this story. So it's enormously successful. So there's a fine line between this kind of wild success and what could be a communicative uh, The paperback princess ultimately does an excellent job of the kind of risks that it's undergoing. So the result here is what we would call a masterpiece. So instead of being rejected, it's not fitting the genre, twists the genre, and it becomes uh, such a wild success basically made a career writer. But what's important to us from a stylistic perspective is that small changes in some kind of tenor relation, the gender identity of one of the characters can lead to very large changes in overall text. Okay, and I will leave it there. Uh, I hope you might have some questions. This is the last uh, picture of the book as well. You can see that Elizabeth no longer has the crown on her head. She's no longer a princess. Instead, she's skipping off into the sunset all by herself. Okay, so uh, any questions? Sir, uh, we'll just, I'll make an announcement to the scholars, okay? Uh, so scholars and uh, faculty, if you have any queries, you can, uh, you're most welcome to ask, sir. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you, sir. It was a very informative presentation. Though many, I mean, terminologies that you have used was new to me, but I was quite surprised by one, uh, I mean, comment that you have made that children did not mind it, but the adults welcomed the ending of the story. So. Could you elaborate, you know, what made a child didn't mind the ending and what made the adult welcome that? So could you please elaborate on it? Thank you. So, yes, that, that's the finding of uh, Davies' paper in 1989. And what she had done, she was looking at uh, the reaction of this uh, as the story was read to children. And not just this story, but a few others. But basically... Um, According to sociologists, I mean, uh, the idea is that children are uh, very early on uh, given an idea of gender roles. Right? So, uh, and, and I don't know how much this has changed, but certainly uh, during this era, the idea of, okay, girls are supposed to wear dresses, boys are supposed to wear trousers, this type of thing. And so there are very kind of um, ideological ideologically driven gender roles that, that children absorb very early. They don't have the same 
uh, ability to push back or to think about these in terms of the nuance. So adults were really uh, quite happy about the inversion of gender roles because they could also see that pushing back against the, the traditional gender roles could be healthy for their own children. So as I mentioned, uh, when, when my daughter was born, uh, one of my friends came over and gave us a copy of his book in order to encourage us to read it to our daughter for you know, these ideas of the gender, the traditional gender roles, fairy tales, and these type of things to be pushed back on. Um, and because she started with this book very early on, she never had a problem with it. So the, this story was normal to her as one of the first children's books. But if, if all you've listened to first are traditional fairy tales and the idea that the prince has to rescue the princess and these type of things, then you would have more trouble uh, accepting this. So the type of comments that, that young children would give, uh, interestingly, some later studies that have come out also have critiqued that she doesn't look like a girl. So there's kind of a fashion issue with her wearing a paper bag and things. But the Davies study did that most of the kids just kind of said uh, she wasn't acting in an acceptable way. So because she decided she would go rescue the prince, uh, and then she ended up rejecting the prince instead of marrying him, that was problematic. Does that kind of answer what you thought? Yes, uh, that's right. And uh, adding to that, you know, one general question I would like to ask you is, you know, so gender roles, sure. gender roles, is it uh, socially constricted or genetically molded? What do you think about it? So will I heard uh, that, you know, there was a time when uh, uh, females used to go out and, you know, they, they were the breadwinners and male, male in the house, taking care of the children and the family. There was a time I read somewhere. <laughs> so would you think that, you know, these roles will be, uh, changed in the future because now we have a gender bias as such and you know, we don't know what a male and what a female we have a lot of uh, you know gender sex issues all of those issues are there so what is your opinion is it gender is the socially constricted feature alone or is it uh, some sort of genetically uh, built or uh, something like that what do you think about it? So, uh, you've used two different terms here, which are sometimes helpful to separate. So, the idea of, of feminist scholars, uh, such as I, I think Judith Butler was one of the first ones to make the, this distinction, is that yes, there's biological sense. So, you can say that, that humans are generally born male or female. Uh, although there are biologically intersex as well, it's not as common. Whereas there are, there's a difference between what we biologically have uh, as just a, a reality. So men, biological men, can't have children. Not to, uh, and then there are differences between the sexes, although, you know, which one of them are, are significant is also an interesting question. But gender roles are very different. So the idea of, you know, which of the partners should stay at home with children, um, part of it's biological because it, uh, the mother is producing milk and it's important for her to be close by the child. That's the feed, feeding source for the child. But after that, there's no biological impairment for having necessarily one parent involved more than another, right? So, so you know, we do have shared uh, duties in the home and things like that, but, but who does what, I think, is, is more of a socially constructed if I could say that. Not all societies can do this in the same way as well. So, you know, depending uh, how organization of the society is, is brought about, um, 
that that is still socialized. It's not a biological. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, that makes sense, and thank you very much. And uh, and I, I'm also not <laughs> saying I'm I'm right on. This. I mean, I, I and I think the ending of the story is great. very, I mean, need of the time, so that you know it is an eye opener as well, because you know many socially constructed norms should be <laughs> changed or evolved in the due course of time. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, you're very welcome. I, I wish I had a simple answer. So, one more question, by another. Excellent. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can I you can. Hear me? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question is to do with the SFL. Uh, when uh, we were looking at the analysis, uh, did this discursive power that Elizabeth has, was this discussed by you in any form in syntactically as well? Or uh, so the mood system is fundamentally syntactical. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so when you have grammatical mm -hmm. yes. it's constructed through syntax. Yeah. Um, discourse power is a bit different, right? So the, the lexical grammar is organized uh, by cho word choice and by yes. uh, syntactical arrangement. Um, but then discourse semantics is, is very different because it has to do with uh, how the exchange is made with the language. Um, so, so for example, uh, you know, an interrogative can be used in. Well, here's a good example. So, uh, imperative mood is, you know, no subject, no finite. It's a syntactical phenomenon. Uh, so, you know, you you can say, okay, an imperative is typically a command, but it doesn't always have to be. So. Um, if, if so my daughter, for example, you can yell at someone to shut up, and that's a command. I want you to stop speaking. But my daughter uses this more in a slang way. So if she's talking to some of her friends, and she's saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. She's not trying to get them to be quiet. She's, she's using that as a question. So she's using that as a like, saying, really, really, really? Okay. So... Just because you have a certain grammatical mood being employed or a certain syntactical pattern, it doesn't mean it's going to function that way yeah. on the, the semantic level. And we do this all the time. In politeness function, we often use uh, interrogative to make statements or, or if we want to give a command, um, I, I might want to be polite. So I, I would you know, ask my wife, would you pass the salt? Well, that, that's interrogative mood. But what I'm really saying is pass the salt, because I'm not asking a question. I'm not asking for an answer to it, which it's capable of. Um, but it, it, politeness features very often see the difference between these levels. So uh, when uh, the mood was analyzed, you looked at form and meaning and function together. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't I quite said, hear you. you. I said when you analyze the mood, uh, the question, uh, the interrogative mood, or the exclamative, whatever mood, you worked with the form, theme, meaning, and function together. All three together. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I apologize. The sorry, sorry. Uh, the, uh, yeah. When you analyze the mood, you looked at form, meaning, and function all together rather than separately. That's what you're saying, telling me in the, in the analysis uh, of the story. Mood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, grammatical mood yeah. is uh, formal. Yes. Whereas the semantic mood, so that, that's a problem. The words are too close to that. Yeah. But the, the semantic, the discourse semantics is more uh, function. So, it, you know, whether you use a certain grammatical mood to achieve a function is a choice of the, the speaker or the writer. Yeah, so most of the time these are, these are very similar. So most of the time 
when we are trying to command someone, we will use imperative, but it, not all right? No, my question was when the analysis for the story was done, what were yes. you using? I use both. You use so, both. That's uh, what I was asking. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm Thank kind you. of crazy as a discourse analyst because yeah. I try to do everything. Yeah. And that's super difficult in a big class. But because this is a children's story and there are only 99 clauses, yeah. I could do a complete analysis of everything. And also because this yeah. is not an oral story in that matter. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's oral, but uh, so the phonological part is anyway out. So you're not. That's looking, right. Yeah, it makes yeah, life yeah. a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it becomes a little easier. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for the question. So, any more questions? Hello. Any more questions from the audience? I, I think there's still a problem with the microphone. So I'm just asking the audience if they have any more questions, sir. That's much clearer. Thank you. So I don't think we have any more questions, sir. I would like to uh, extend uh, our heartfelt gratitude to you for uh, uh, helping us to understand the the dynamics of uh, analyzing uh, text and also the language elements using the tools of uh, systematic uh, functional uh, linguistics and uh, thank you also for uh, giving your insights uh, into the genres the use of genre and how important it is and uh, uh, helping us also to understand that it is not just a schemata uh, it is not actual, it's not climate also. And uh, you have also helped us to, uh, to interpret uh, how to make textual analysis in terms of syntax and diction and how logical relationships are structured. So thank you very much, sir, for uh, uh, giving us this, uh, that uh, very uh, meaningful and uh, very excellent uh, talk on... Uh, language and uh, linguistics, especially the stylistic analysis. So uh, we will always owe our gratitude to you for uh, spending your uh, precious moments with us uh, and uh, especially to the Department of English and uh, uh, this great university. And our convener of the conference would like to also share her views, sir. So please uh, hold on. Thank you very much. Good evening, Professor Derek. It's so nice Hello. of you to have agreed to our proposal in the very beginning. And you were the first one who, give, who gave us the green uh, kind of gesture to us. And we really thank you for supporting us. And please support us in our future collaborations too. And once again, on behalf of Cal University, Department of English, we extend you our great Grateful thanks to you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. Again, I'm so sorry I'm not there in person. I would love to be there with you. But uh, if you could send me a picture of the event, that would be wonderful. And as well, if uh, anyone has any questions for me, and you do have my email, so you can share it with your colleagues. Sure, sir. We have given you YouTube link of your presentations to the online um, registrations, the delegates who have registered online. So your uh, session was shared to them through YouTube link. Thank you so much, sir. The, it is also recorded. Thank you and, so much for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, it's recorded and they will also watch in their free time. And thank you very much on behalf of KL University, the Department of English. Thank you very much, sir. A big namaskar to you, sir. Thank you again. It was very nice. Very nice of you to invite. Bye, sir. Bye. Goodbye to everyone. Bye.
So delegates, we'll just wait for uh, five minutes. The tea is on the way and also the online session uh, presenters will be here with us. And we have uh, one more last plenary session, uh, which will be delivered by our uh, dear professor. And uh, so just uh, wait for a couple of minutes, please.
we are almost on the uh, verge of completing our uh, conference and before that we have uh, one very interesting uh, plenary speech by professor smriti sarkar and uh, she is a professor in the department of linguistics and contemporary english school of language sciences ma'am we are very happy to have you and uh, we you have been waiting since morning almost so sorry for keeping you uh, wait for such a long time but uh, i hope you do understand and uh, thank you so much ma'am for being here with us despite your busy schedule and uh, before uh, uh, i invite madam formally to enlighten the audience uh, uh, with her talk i would like to uh, invite uh, uh, mr k sajid scholar department of uh, english to introduce uh, our dear madam to the gathering audience so let me have the pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, professor suti sarkar and uh, she said a professor of linguistics at the efl university hyderabad her research focuses on language acquisition in the first and second language in children and adults language processing and reading and spelling development in indian languages in typically and atypically developing learners she conducts experimental research in language acquisition linguistics and the language cognition interface she received her phd from central institute of english and foreign languages in 2002 and joined in the department of methods as lecturer uh, in uh, in 2002 since 2008 she has been a faculty member in the department of linguistics and contemporary english and presently a professor in the department along with many students she studies language acquisition in children and adults the interface between language and cognitive psychology and language impairment and reading disorders this kind of research often requires a wide range of methods from developmental psychology language processing formal syntax and semantics and students working with her receive rigorous training in experimental methods and task design the thrust areas of research are first and second language acquisition morphological phonological and syntactic processing phonology orthography mappings reading and spelling development in children language disorders test creation for english proficiency and she has got 11 publications and over 13 books and her project includes phonological and orthographic knowledge of children learning to read bengali funded and sponsored by the promise foundation bangalore and uh, she has been carrying administrative responsibilities in as a dean research since uh, june 20, uh, 2017 to 2018 and uh, as a deputy dean research from 2015 to 2017 and officer on special duty admissions and examination 2015 to 2018 officer on special duty academic 2017 to 2019 secretary member g cash pars 2015 to 2018 first university convocation nodal officer 2017 and her professional affiliations include editor of the efl journal editorial board language languaging languaging receiver reviewer for reading and writing and interdisciplinary journal member braille council of india from 2019 onwards doctoral committee for phd scholars in uoh and iit hyderabad it's my immense pleasure and thank you very much ma'am thank you mr saji for that and ma'am most of our scholars are working on english language teaching and linguistics so uh, scholars i request you to listen very carefully so that uh, you will you can learn uh, many things from what madam is going to deliver and uh, it will be of great help to you she's going to speak on cognitive processes and language comprehension the mind leads the eye good afternoon uh, it's my pleasure to be here 
in Kale University. This is my first time in Kale University. I've been to Vijayawada Guntur earlier. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sunandini, Dr. Divya, for calling me. And uh, I know that I'm the oddball out here because most of the talks were on uh, literature and something to do with language studies. I'm taking you a little away. Uh, I will start with what uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kamal Mehta, if I'm not wrong, said that we work with this idea that Bhed uh, Bhutti. Now, linguistics and psycholinguistics is actually doing a Bhed Bhutti. We are trying to bring together uh, the entire composition of the mind with relation to language. So this is one kind of sneak peek into what is happening inside our head when we are doing something with language. Since I can't look at many things, I'm looking at just a very small fragment of things to do with reading words and sentences. So uh, let me uh, begin uh, with a very simple thing that uh, when you're listening to me or when I'm reading, I look at the word and I know everything about the word. So that is how our reading is building. So when I say that reading is magical, I'm saying it is magical because we don't realize the underlying cognitive processing that is involved in this whole process of reading, which looks as if it is a matter of fact. Once you know how to read, anybody can do it. It is that kind of facility. But if you understand the kinds of things that is happening inside our mind, it is amazing that we are able to do something like this. So, uh, if you look at something like this, this is what we do. We see words, we recognize words, we understand words. It's, it's a very simple process. So, you can see that there is something, a figure there. What do you see? You see a square, but the square doesn't exist. There is no square, but we all see a square. So, what is our mind doing? So mind is not dependent on the eye. My mind is, or our minds are doing double the work that our eyes are doing. So it is the, this, uh, what we see and what we think we see are two different things. They're not the same. So it is not like there is a word in my head. I see the word and click. It goes and clicks on this and I know the word. This is not what is happening. So that is why I say that what we see and what we uh, think we see or what we interpret are two different worlds. So what do you see? What is this? Now read. So what I actually see is two horizontal lines, uh, two vertical lines and one horizontal line. That's all I see. My eyes receive only that symbol. When I say, what do you see? You don't see an H or A. You see only lines. You are interpreting it as H or A or maybe a ladder, maybe something. Now read. So the same line, the same two vertical lines, one horizontal line takes on two different meanings. So we are not dependent on the eye. Our mind is working on what we receive as visual data to interpret it. So this reading, what we are saying, is to do with vision, no doubt about it. But there is a cognitive processing involved. So then we come to this idea, what do you do? What do you say? I show you a word and you say, ah, I know this word. What is it that you know? You know its phonology, it's, uh, you know whether it's a noun or a verb, you know the meaning of the word, you also know what it attaches to. So, for example, if I, this is a typical example in language acquisition. If I give you a nonsense word and say blick, blick is a kind of animal, B-L-I-C-K, there are two all of you will say blicks. 
you will automatically add an s a s so you know that nouns will take s as a plural so that's the morphological information everything is available to me and this looks very simple because it looks like one unit and everything is available but this is the process if you look at the process if you see the word wonder and you will see that there are meaning relates there are syntactic information there is uh, morphological information there is phonological and each is coming at a different step so each is a cognitive process for us but this is happening in one tenth of a second even less so we are able to access all this process within 250 milliseconds now another interesting fact about words so if i ask you where are the words in your head do you think it has a store where you are keeping all the words they are all there so if i crack open somebody's skull it's in human i won't find a segment which has all the words in it so where are the words how do i get the words now the brain has four lobes anybody who has done basic 10 knows this that there are different lobes the frontal lobe the parietal lobe the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe and then you have the cortices the motor cortices which help you uh, speak the uh, oral oral cortices which help you hear the visual cortices which help you see so you have different kinds of neural material substrate in your head now the words don't reside in any of these lobes let us look at it frontal lobe takes care of the speech sounds because the motor cortices are in the frontal lobe the parietal lobe takes care of the orthographic structures because you have the visual things here then the temporal lobe takes care of the meaning and the occipital lobe takes care of the orthography which means that the word is distributed across different parts of the brain some information is here 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 so what are we doing when we are looking at a word and recognizing a word we are assembling all of them from all domains and we are doing it in 200 milliseconds and this is why i say that reading is magical because you are doing it in a jiffy there is nothing called the word in your head you are compiling the word from different kinds of sources but within a second you are able to say ah i know this word right so what is this then the other thing about the word that we think that words are in uh, in a vacuum that each word is a separate entity they are all interlinked it's a big semantic network it's like a web all words are related so for example i give you one word i give you word let's say sleep and i say quick give me as many words as possible you will be able to rattle off words you say bed sofa sleep uh, rest multiple things it won't take you time to put together the list of five words why because it is like you are puddle you drop a stone and you can see the waves separating so as the waves separate it takes more words in. so the waves you can see that the power is the strongest when it is at the center and gradually it fades out so this is the level of activation when i see a word i hear a word i activate one word and all the related words are activated they are fired they start burning and in the brain you can see the electromagnetic impulses 
if you do a study which uh, looks at uh, fMRI. But it, our brain is not like a dictionary. Dictionary is an external system. It is not like a dictionary. So let's take a word like turn, T-U-R-N. The moment I hear turn, I think turn would, uh, I would activate words like bend, uh, move, which are semantically related. But it also activates words which are phonologically similar, which have the same sound. So you can see turf, turkey, uh, turtle, turn, turbo, turquoise, turnip, all these are activated. So if I go back to my slide, earlier slide, most of these network that you saw was to do with semantic relatedness. Now you see that it also works with phonological relatedness. They are also, how do we know this? We have lots and lots of experiments. So every experiment reveals a small way in which our mind works. So this is, this whole idea is what is called the cohort model, which was by Barsley and Wilson, which is one of the well-known models of lexical access. So what happens is, I see things, and my mind starts, all the words which start with C, everything is activated every kind of word with T. Then you see T-U, then T-U, all the words with T. The ones with T-I are suppressed because I don't have data for it. So at every stage, one with every letter, because when you're hearing a word, you are looking at it linear. Your ears are hearing it linear. So you are continuously activating new words and inhibits the, the ones that do not match it. So this is the model that you can see. And finally, you arrive at a stage where there is only one token. So let's do a task. So I will show you letter, and you don't have to say it loud. Just keep thinking about the words. So shall we start? One. Think of all the words. Blocks. Next. What is the word? You're right. What is the word? You think the catapult? Catapult? What else? Catechism? Cataract? But you now you see that from CA, your number of items have reduced. Because very few words have C A T A. Now I put in S. Now what happens? You all know that there is only one word of this kind. Right? Only one word. But are you sure? There are very few words. Now I jump, keep jumping. Till this is okay. Now I dump. Yes. So what happens? When you come to I, you know that there is only one word. But when you come to S, you have two words at least. Or you have three words. You can have catastrophical, catastrophically. You have very few items. So our brain is continuously activating words and suppressing the ones which do not match the data. So this the S is my recognition point because it is that point. Ah, I know the word now. I can immediately say. But there are still possible four tokens. That's why when I come to B, e, I know that it is to be. If, when I come to C, I know that it is only one word. There is only one in my entire basket. So this is how our minds are working when it comes to words. And this is the cohort point. Now, when we look at language comprehension, we normally think, okay, uh, let us see what happens in the head. I have the fMRI thing. It's not very clear. But what you can see is that 
when you look at comprehension listening comprehension and reading comprehension the areas of the brain that are activated are the nature of activation is different so the areas that get show electromagnetic impulse in your brain for listening is sections which have to do with sound areas which show activation in the brain with regulation of reading are the areas which have to do with the eyes so you see that there are two separate areas that are getting activated which means that the processes of reading comprehension are very different from the processes of listening comprehension right and how do we know all this there are a lot of tasks one is as we see the fmri the functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging which is the picture that you see which is a direct measure because you are directly looking into the brain and you are measuring the location and the nature of the activity nature of the the strength of the electromagnetic pulse that is the measure but we have other measures which humanities people can which are called uh, self paced reading or eye movement tracking we have offline task and online task offline task is something like uh, i give you a sentence and say what did you understand so that is after you have read i am asking you a question that is a offline task but online task is the measure is as you are doing the activity that's why it's called online there are two kinds of tasks and we are going to look at these two kinds of tasks so how do we know all this that i talked about about the brain it is by experimental testing so psycholinguistics is mainly a set of experimental work to understand the function of the brain with relation to language so what we do is we look at what is called the reaction time how much time does it take to react before this i want to do something with you i am going to ask you Okay, you have to say white, 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 white. What does a cow drink? You will. Most of the people say milk. If you say white, 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 white ten times, and I immediately ask you a question, what does a cow drink? You say milk. Why? Why? yes because the moment you start white all the things that are white get activated in your brain cow and milk are related which we all know that cows don't drink it milk calves do the cows do right but still are brain so what are we doing we are checking the time if i give you think about it and tell me nobody will do it but if you have to do it immediately you go right so this is the kind of work that we are doing we are trying to find out how is how how fast do we and how accurate are you because if you take more time it means that your brain is thinking over it which means that there is a complication or a difficulty difficulty here doesn't mean that uh, i am not able to solve it means that there is some complexity in it right so the lower the accuracy the higher the reaction time or response time it talks about the processing difficulty that is the measure say the word quick quick
the same like the outside things are influencing none of them are so if you look at the picture none of them are soup there is no picture which is of a soup there is no picture which is of a soap which means that the context is also activating a certain word right now take a look at this this is what is called a semantic priming task it is mainly that i give a word after a brief after 200 seconds i give another word the second word which is the target i have to make a decision whether the word is uh, a word in english or not so i am going to show you a word you have to say whether it is english yes you have to say yes the last yes will be slower now i'll show you the time <coughs> look at the time second which is taking the lowest time bread and butter once you see bread thank you once you see bread butter takes less time because bread has already activated the butter but nurse does not activate the butter that's why it is taking 955 milliseconds so our word recognition is dependent on what words we see before it and if you don't see any word it is in 40 milliseconds right milliseconds is less than a second okay so this is how the activation is happening now i am going to show you a um, way in which see look at this i have activated bread butter doesn't take that same amount of time it takes less of time now this is something that we did not know about the brain it is because of psycholinguistic experiments that we realize that what we see before a word speeds up our processing time now we come to another interesting part that is how do we process lexical lexically ambiguous words there are a lot of words which have more than one meaning right so what happens when we see a word with two meanings what does the brain do does the brain recognize that this has two meanings or does it only activate one meaning so take a look at this a pastor a priest and a rabbi walked into a bar which is the ambiguous part what is a bar a place where you drink and what happens in this picture this is a metal bar so bar has two meanings you will laugh only if you understand that bar has two meanings this is a pun in the second one uh, which is um, in uh, louis carroll and dr seuss are famous for these kinds of things so he says how many hours a day did you do lessons said alice in a hurry to change the subject 10 hours the first day said the mock turtle nine the next and so on what a curious plan exclaimed alice that's the reason they are called lessons because it lessens every day right this is also a pun okay how do we handle this in our brain how do we handle these kinds of lexically ambiguous words do we activate all the meanings do we activate only the meaning that the context requires what do we do so this is an experiment which is again a classic experiment by swiney uh, 
where what he did was he took a word like bug b u g bug has two meanings one is where you bug a room that is you put hidden cameras or hidden uh, something which is bugging a room or you can say it is a bug that is cockroaches spiders insects something like that so bug has two separate meanings now i create a task where there is a context which does not support either of the two meanings of the bug right it it is neutral so this is the no context rumor had it that for years the government building had been plagued with problems the man was not surprised when he found several bugs in the corner of his room it doesn't tell you which bug there is a biasing context so the other condition is that rumor had it that for years the government building had been plagued with problems the man was not surprised when he found several spiders cockroaches and other bugs so the spiders cockroaches tell you which meaning of the bug is being asked for then you have the non ambiguous structures now let me look at you will find that near bugs there is a one superscript there is a corner two superscript the task was such that people had to listen to the sentence and while they were listening to the sentence a word would appear on the screen so the word was either a word like ant or a word like spy or a word like pen right and they would appear exactly when you see the word bug because spy is one word which is linked with bug with one meaning of bug ant is another meaning of bug pen is a neutral word which is not related to bug so it would appear either near the bug or near the corner this word will appear why because we want to see whether people make any Uh, is there a time difference because they have to press whether ant is a word or not so you have to say yes the moment you see the visual word as you are listening to this thing so if you take time to press yes to ant then you know that you are taking more time to process the word because there is a uh, oral data also now take a look at this this is the data that we found that when you hear an which is related to the meaning it is very fast when you hear spy it is fast when you don't hear a neutral word it is slow near the bug which means that when you hear bug both the meanings of the words are aligned the context has no meaning because you take the same amount of time to press and or to press spy irrespective of whether there are the sentences like there were other insects like cockroaches um, whatever and you press the same amount that the spy also is the same amount of time which means that the context has no role to play you are activating both the means but later stage when you show the words at corner there shows you see that the related meaning is fast the unrelated meaning is slow now what does this mean what does this experiment mean that our when i said that when you hear a word all related meanings all related words are activated this is an automatic activation we have no control it immediately activates if we have to control it we don't die that's why at 200 milliseconds i am not able to control it but at 700 milliseconds i can control the meaning so this activation process is automatic it is outside human control no human can control it at 200 so what do we understand from this in terms of brain that most of the time when we are looking at word it starts an automatic activation 
which is not within our willful control. We have no conscious control. If we need to control it, we need to time. And therefore, reading a word is automatic and we are able to access information in different parts of the brain without any difficulty. Now we come to sentence processing. This was word. How much time do we have? Now, what we are going to look at is, is this the same process with sentences? Because sentences is a different kind of story again. Right? So, what, are, what do we do when we hear a sentence or when we read a sentence? Are there roadblocks? So, take a look at this. So, I see this phrase, the horse. I can construct any of these pictures in my head, right? I can think of a standing horse, I can think of a running horse, I can think of a horse reading a book, any of them. I mean, it's open. The horse is open. The moment I hear raised, and I am constructing what is called a syntactic structure. So I am saying that, okay, this is a sentence, and I already have the subject, which is the end piece. So I am waiting for the verb phrase now, the predicate. And I get the predicate. What happens? I have got raised. Immediately, I inhibit all those images which were not racing. The horse reading a book inhibited, the horse standing inhibited. And I've got my book. Right? So my sentence is okay. So the horse is the one who is doing the racing. Right? Now I get a preposition, which is also good because I can say the horse is racing in the field, the horse is racing uh, something towards the house, whatever. It's fine. Uh, my sentence construction looks fine. Then I get past the bar, which is also fine because when I have a preposition, I need a location. So the location is the bar. So my sentence is going there. Now comes the next. Now what happens? All place past the land. All of a sudden, my God, where did the fell come from? Where should I fit the fell now? I don't know where to. What is the sentence? I must have made a mistake. So who fell? Did the barn fall? Did the horse fall? Who fell? I don't know. So I have to reanalyze this. So what will I do? Which is the main verb? Fail. So what is raised? I know that in a sentence you can't have two verbs which are tensed. Two past tense cannot exist. So one must be something else. So then I rework the raised. And what do I find? It is the horse that raised past the barn. So, because there was no that, I pretended or I thought, I was misled into believing that race was the main goal. And that's why when I came to spell, there was a total confusion and a total crashing until I figured out. Right? So, I will then figure out said that. What am I doing? At every stage, I am constructing a syntactic representation. And at the end, if the syntactic representation is something that is meaningful, then it is fine. If it is not meaningful, then I have to be. Right? And this is called the garden path sentence. Take a look at this structure. So, if you are ready, clap. Clap. No, continuous no. If you clap, a word will come. If you clap, uh, one clap, word will come. Okay, right. It will go back. See, you have to keep in mind 
the letters that are coming because one comes the other goes away now what happened is that all of you slowed down after the bite why because i thought it is the defendant who examined the moment i got by i realized that the defendant is not the agent it is the patient it is the defendant who is being examined the pie is telling me that's why you see that at by time to give the next clap was after 800 milliseconds all the others are between 350 milliseconds to two. so it's a simple it is a kind of task where it is you get the sentence in this blanks on the screen as you press you will get the next word so i can count when you are making the press and on the basis of that i will make a judgment about your case this is called a self paced reading it's an excellent thing and we are working with multiple things in indian languages with this and we are finding very interesting things with this okay the second kind of task that we use is called a i movement So, if you look at the self-paced task, you are actually pressing these keys for the words to come. So, you are somewhere. You are directly involved. Your pressing is directly involved. Eye tracking is when you can see that you are being tested. So, when if I have to look at the entire screen, uh, entire audience, I will not start looking from left to right. We don't want to find. in your back i can see a pink shirt there i can see a pink oh, green sari there so my eyes will be drawn to different points so this is the trajectory you can see the trajectory of the eye movement so what i do is i try the trajectory of the eye movement to see how the mind works because i Your eye automatically does this. So you don't know that you're being tested. But I use the eye as a lens in your eye, right? So the eye actually tracking the eye gives me the subconscious behavior, and with which I am able to make a judgment about the mind. So this sentence: the knight attacked the windmill on his donkey. you can see the kinds of eye movement you can see one after one you get two two three then you jump to uh, the the you don't read four five then you go to uh, something else six again you go to attack then seven is on the mill your eyes are moving backward and forward backward and forward you are not moving your eye in a linear so i am testing how long your eyes are resting in specific section and how many times you are going back to something to read because if you are going back if you are pressing your eye is pressing to something i will be able to say that you are doing so take a look at this this was the data that we saw right the horse raced past the barn fence the horse takes 221 milliseconds race in the first instant is then after 5 after 156 again i go back to because 290 all together race is taking something about 565 50 milliseconds which is far more than all the So it is the same logic that we use with that quick case, but here I am using a unconscious method to find out. And there is a more sophisticated version now, where we look at the dilation of the pupils to find out how the mind is. So this is the kind of screen that you get, and they now you have much simpler eye tracking machine. have the toby glasses 
which is which has a cord and which you link to your computer and it tracks your entire eye tracking as you eat. Right. So let us look at another experiment. And this is an experiment where on the screen pictures of four objects come. So you have a candle, you have a necklace, you have a sandwich, and you have a sandwich. And as you're looking at the screen, the word sandal appears. So normally, this is a, you don't have to do anything. So the normal thing is that your eye automatically will go to the sandal. Right? The moment you hear the word, you'll pick the right picture. You don't have to do anything. Physically, you don't have to. So I have a gadget which is checking where you are looking. So our understanding is if you only go to that segment which it matches, but let's look at what happens. This is the graph. So orange is the sample. So you can look at the time period, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. You see that it goes to the sandwich, but it also goes to sandwich. Your eyes also go to sandwich. Your eyes also go to sandwich. Sandwich is also candle is even if you said I will not look at the others, I will only look at the target even then your eyes. Because your eyes are not giving it is an unconscious process. And therefore, this is an excellent way of tapping your mind. Now I'm going into this course. So Draco Malfoy hit Harry Potter. He was really mad. Who was mad? Who was mad? I can use my context. The person who hit was mad. The person who got hit was mad. So if I give a sentence like this and if I give a picture, you will find that your eyes will go to both sides. Yeah, your eye will go to both sides. Your eye fixation. Or but the moment I change the syntactic structure, Draco Malfoy hit him. Now he did not it has to be. So our eyes are being controlled by our syntactic. How we understand, because these are linguistic principles, right? These are not anything which has to do with common knowledge. It is, it is basic syntactic framework that is controlling where I look, uh, where I look. Right? So, in a way, what we are saying there is that our mind and our eye are two separate organs. We have started with this idea that the eye sees something, but the mind interprets it. Right? Now what we are doing is, we are making the eye a slave. And we are using the eye to understand. So that's why the mind leaves the eye and the eye does not. And this eye, mind eye correspondence is what we are using as a tool in order to understand the brain and the functioning of the brain with relation to the So, this is what we, I wanted to show you is that there are lots of exposed possibilities of encyclopedia where we are trying to uncover the cognitive world. And what we see of the brain and then we that's why we are trying to find out more about the brain. And there is a beautiful domain of work 
which is to do with uh, something to do with the uh, space uh, self paced reading where you have the mouse and you have a mouse movement tracking also so you see where you move the mouse whether it is a straight diagonal cut or it's a curved cut so how much of area is covered means how much are you distracted so we are working with different kinds of methodologies to figure out how to and that is the project of psychedelics thank you can uh, ask uh, questions and clarify your doubts please madam uh, so one question out of curiosity let me ask uh, so language and thought you know words are actually sometimes the container of the ideas but uh, you have said that you know words uh, are not uh, assemble i mean not remain as such in any part of the brain but are assembled later and in that sense you know how thought exists you know, because thought and uh, words are not uh, no one to one relationship with there is no one to one relationship with the word and thought and how is there any connection so without language can we think that is the that is a straight question uh, what language, uh, what is think? your uh, definition of language speech <laughs> language is uh, something speech sorry ma'am speech definition of speech no no is language speech for you uh, no hmm. it's not just speech okay let me uh, help you with something ball went down rolled yeah something okay so i see ball okay now ball is there a difference is a difference one is think about it the ball rolled into the cave the other is ball went into the cave rolling syntactically they are two different things right now when you think about sign language what are the words signs the manual signs the manual signs so what we are saying is for example uh, if you look at sign language they have only one wh question that is there's only one wh this is wh right so if i say where i'll have to say place document right right what is the word there what is the word because what you are considering is what is a word who is a word i am breaking it place plus wh is a word so this is the same story that i was telling you that in terms of the mind the phonology orthography semantics syntax they are distributed across the brain lobes so we are assembling it but once we assemble it and make it give it a form that becomes a word so your question of language and thought that's a ongoing question so what do you do with a child who doesn't have enough language do you say that the child has no thought it has limited thought age appropriate thought it will convey it in a the child says ball but doesn't even say ball says ball what does it mean does it mean give me the ball the ball is rolling don't give go, give the ball away the ball is going away what does the child say how do we tap 
So until we tap this, we will never be able to ask a question. There is a scientist who is working on this, a person called uh, Elizabeth Spelke, who works with children, cognition, and she, is, she has come up with this theorization that there is something called a core knowledge which children are born with, not like the universal grammar. Uh, knowledge of space, knowledge of more or less, knowledge of enclosure. These are ingrained uh, properties that child is born with. So if that is considered thought, then all children. Yes, yes. No, no, no. Spelke is not. Uh, that, that is uh, Snowly. That's Snowly. Madam, uh, what I understood, you know, we, we cannot even understand what thought is, right? But thought is something very abstract and we, we do not know about it. Concept. Sorry? It's at the level of concept. Yeah. So, but how it exists in the brain, we yeah, do not so For know. example, if I tell you, uh, what do you call a uh, child of a cat? Kitten. Kitten. What, in, what do you call in uh, our own languages? Is there a word for kitten? No. Thought to same here. Thought is the same. But the form is different. One is a genitive case marked two NPs. The other is a single N. Thought is the same. The form it takes is different. Right? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for helping us to understand the, how the cognitive processes uh, uh, takes place in the mind and uh, the different elements of language and how the mind works in understanding the syntactic structures and also the diction. So thank you so much. It's quite dry and, you know, transcending, but still it is very interesting. I hope your uh, points... Uh, would have uh, will be very useful to the scholars, especially working on linguistics and uh, language. So uh, your presentation was really very uh, nice, ma'am, and uh, you had a very good composure with a sweet smile. So thank you, thank you so much on behalf of the Department of English and also KLEF. So we uh, participants will in a few minutes we will begin the valedictory session. So we'll just take off a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. Please stay here in the hall. We are just waiting for uh, the pro-chancellor to come. So please uh, remain uh, silent.
rather we all wanted to have the presentations in the <laughs> 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 